the Bible to the cross from the cross. Every Bible story has three components. First, God's love. Second, God's compassion. Third, God's miracle. Opening your Bible opens miracles. The Bible as one story is holy enough in our lives. Day 305, Luke 21 to 22. They await the Last Supper. For telling his disciples the suffering to come, Jesus asked them to be patient, to endure to the end, and to be victorious. First point. Jesus taught about the difference of paying tax and making an offering to God. During the final week of his ministry in Jerusalem, Jesus observed the offerings made by the rich and by the poor widow. The poor widow offered to God two copper coins. This was worth one-fourth of the price of two small bodies at the time. The poor widow had offered to God a small amount of money in terms of market value. However, this was all the money she had. Jesus stressed that although the wealthy paid a great amount and the poor widow paid a small amount, her offering was worth more in the kingdom of God, as she had offered all she had to God. Jesus then went on to teach about the tax money of the world and the tithe in the kingdom of God. We are reminded of how the people had to pay tribute to empires, as they did not pay offerings to God. To look at the story of offerings, we can go back to Exodus. Second, we can look at the records in Leviticus. Third, we can look at the records in Deuteronomy. The people of Israel did not keep the covenant they made with God in the kingdom of Christus and ultimately had to pay the price of tribute to various empires. For example, King Hosea of North Israel had to pay tribute to Assyria. King Hezekiah of South Judah also had to pay tribute to Assyria. Likewise, the people of South Judah were eventually taken to Babylon for 70 years, as they had not kept God's laws and did not make offerings to God. Second point, Jesus promised that once all nations received the gospel, he would return with full glory. Jesus was extremely busy throughout his three-year public life, but he was the busiest during his final week in Jerusalem. Despite being so busy, Jesus still took the time to teach his disciples. Jesus taught them how Jerusalem would fall as well as how it would be restored again. Jesus first told them of the time Jerusalem would fall. It would experience a great deal of hardship until Jesus' second coming. Jesus declared that when all the foreign people heard his gospel, the world would come to an end. St. Paul spoke about this subject later on. Jesus declared that on the final day, there would be judgment and then Jesus would return. Jesus used the parable of the fig tree in order to teach them about how Christians were to prepare for this final day. Therefore, Jesus told them to always be alert and to pray. As such, Jesus taught his disciples right up to his final time. Third point, Luke recorded that Jesus prepared for the final Passover with Peter and John. In Luke chapter 22, we come across how the teachers of the law and the high priestess schemed to kill Jesus and how Judas Iscariot looked for the opportunity to hand Jesus over to the Sanhedrin assembly. In the meantime, Jesus observed the final Passover with his disciples and then held the first ever communion during their final feast. The other Gospels record that Jesus had two of his disciples prepare for the final Passover, and in Luke's Gospel, it is recorded that the two disciples were Peter and John.
When the table was set, Jesus started his last supper with his disciples. Jesus observed Passover, which was a 1,500-year-old tradition, and changed the dish to the first ever communion. Communion was an act of commemorating Jesus. When Jesus said his cup was made up of the new covenant, it symbolized that it was no longer about the old covenant. Through communion, Jesus gave the new covenant. Jesus said that he wished to observe Passover with his disciples. Jesus taught that the first Passover 1,500 years ago contained God's vision of it being completed through the Holy Communion. In other words, the first Passover held in Egypt was carried out to introduce Holy Communion 1,500 years later. The next day, Jesus was nailed on the cross, which was the most holy place that was not man-made. On this day, Judas Iscariot betrayed Jesus. Also, on this day, the disciples argued over who was greater between them. Jesus then predicted that Peter would deny him three times that night. Fourth point, Luke recorded how Jesus prayed on the night he was crucified so earnestly that his sweat was like drops of blood. Before being arrested by the Sanhedrin assembly, Jesus went to get this money to pray as usual. Judas Iscariot knew that Jesus prayed during the night. Jesus took three of his disciples with him and told them to pray not to be tempted. Jesus prayed with his knees on the rock. As Jesus had prayed near the disciples, they would have been able to hear his prayer. The disciples, however, did not sense what was about to happen and so fell asleep. Luke recorded that Jesus prayed until his sweat drops were like drops of blood falling to the ground. The cross was something Jesus had to take, but it was such a painful load. Jesus decided to obey God's will. He prayed to God to carry out his will. Fifth point. Before his hands were tied together, Jesus used them to heal the ear of the high priest's servant. Jesus was arrested by the members sent by the Sanhedrin assembly. The first thing to happen was the betrayal of Judas Iscariot. Judas Iscariot used the symbol of respect and love of kissing as a symbol of betrayal. At the moment Jesus was arrested, Peter took out his knife and sliced off the right ear of the servant of the high priest. When the servant screamed, the man holding Jesus let go, and Peter tried to use this moment to take Jesus away. However, Jesus told Peter to put away his sword, and then used his free hands to heal the servant's ear. Then he was taken to the Sanhedrin assembly, where he was questioned all night. During this time, Peter denied Jesus three times. Jesus did not speak until they finally asked whether he was the Son of God, to which Jesus answered yes. This gave them the perfect cause to accuse him of blasphemy. Day 306, Luke 23 to 24 Invitation to Glory and Peace Jesus, who came to the disciples after the resurrection, taught them that his suffering and the resurrection was a fulfillment of the Old Testament and appointed them as witnesses. First point, Luke thoroughly recorded Jesus' trials by the Sanhedrin assembly, by Pontius Pilate, by Herod, and then by Pontius Pilate again. After being arrested by the Sanhedrin assembly, Jesus was taken to the court of the high priest's house, where he was interrogated. Afterwards, he was taken to the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate. The Sanhedrin assembly had an idea 
of how to go ahead and sentence Jesus to death, and this was to accuse him of blasphemy. However, they were cautious on the one hand, as they were aware that there were many Jews who were still upset over the death of John the Baptist. Therefore, they did not want to stone Jesus to death, as this would have made enemies out of the Jews. They wanted to bring back all the people who became followers of Jesus, and so used the Roman Empire to kill Jesus. They accused Jesus of blasphemy and quoted Jesus of being the king of the Jews. The reason the Sanhedrin assembly passed Jesus over to Pontius Pilate was in order to mask the whole thing as a political riot, and thus began the trial under the Roman Empire. Pilate knew exactly what the Sanhedrin assembly was after, but nevertheless, the trial went on. Pilate was taken aback by Jesus' answer, as Jesus admitted that he was the king of the Jews. Despite this being a crime, Pilate still proclaimed Jesus innocent. When the Sanhedrin assembly disapproved, Pilate handed this case to Herod. Herod's trial is only recorded in Luke's Gospel. When Jesus did not do anything, Herod ridiculed Jesus and made him wear the robe of a king. Because of the Sanhedrin assembly, Jesus' second trial and the Pilate began again. Pilate did not want to make this trial any bigger. Pilate declared Jesus as innocent, but in order to satisfy the Sanhedrin assembly, he told them that Jesus would be punished by being whipped. This, of course, was not what the Sanhedrin assembly wanted to hear. The Jews that the Sanhedrin assembly bribed demanded that Jesus be crucified. It appeared that they would riot if Jesus was not crucified. Because of this, Pilate gave in and commanded the crucifixion of Jesus. What the Sanhedrin assembly did not know was that everything was going to God's plan, not theirs. Second point, Luke recorded Jesus' crucifixion and his death all in detail. Luke recorded Jesus' suffering in chronological order. The first was that Simon from Sidon carried the cross for Jesus. This was because Jesus was questioned all throughout the night and therefore was physically unable to carry the cross. The second was when the women who followed Jesus lamented and Jesus consulted them. Jesus told them to lament more for the fall of Jerusalem, which was to come. The third was when Jesus was nailed to the cross. Jesus was crucified with two other sinners. This was the fulfillment of the waters of Isaiah. The fourth was the seven sayings of Jesus. The fifth was how Jesus was ridiculed by the people. The sixth was how Jesus still saved the people whilst he was on the cross. The seventh was the moment he died on the cross. Third point, Jesus predicted the cross and his suffering on multiple occasions, and thus the Sanhedrin assembly made someone watch over Jesus' tomb after he died. When Jesus breathed his final breath on the cross, no one could dare to ask to bury him. It was here that a man came forth. When Jesus was born, he was assisted by the poor Joseph, and when he died, he was buried by the rich Joseph. When Jesus became buried, a new issue sparked, and this was the issue of resurrection. During Jesus' ministry, he had spoken about resurrection on many occasions. The Sanhedrin assembly wished to cover this completely and so bribed the Pontius Pilate to make soldiers go and guard over the tomb. However, the soldiers of the Roman Empire could not stop Jesus' resurrection. Jesus defeated death and resurrected after three days. The angel of the Lord told this to the women and also to the disciples. Fourth point, historian Luke recorded the conversation Jesus had with his disciples after his resurrection. 
after resurrected Jesus went to go and find his disciples. Jesus had a conversation with two of his disciples. These two disciples, through their conversation, showed that they had not believed in resurrection. However, Jesus came to teach them again. Even when they heard this from Jesus, they still did not know that it was Jesus. And until they had something to eat, they failed to recognize that it was him. The disciples thereon proclaimed and testified Jesus. They immediately headed towards Jerusalem to proclaim Jesus. Peter had met Jesus at this stage also, and thus all the disciples came to know that Jesus had resurrected. Fifth point, Luke recorded how Jesus told the disciples to stay in Jerusalem in anticipation of the next age of the apostles. The resurrected Jesus came to the eleven disciples. Jesus convinced them that he was indeed Jesus. Jesus showed them his nailed hands and told them to touch it in order to help them recognize him. After this, Jesus gave them the Great Commission. Jesus told his disciples to be his witness and also to stay in Jerusalem. And then Jesus ascended to heaven. Luke recorded Jesus' ascension in Acts chapter 1. Luke's gospel ends with the people praising God and waiting for Jesus in Jerusalem. Day 307, John 1 to 3. Jesus who became light. Jesus came to this world as the light to save humankind. And John the Baptist prepared the way for Jesus with joy. First point, St. John introduced Jesus as the light. Matthew started his gospel from Abraham. Mark started his gospel with the Son of God. Luke started his gospel with God. And John started his gospel with the creation. John testified that Jesus existed from the beginning of time. Thus, John traced his way to Genesis 1 verse 1. John, moreover, expressed Jesus as right and life and proclaimed that Jesus came to the world as the light of life. John introduced John the Baptist first. John the Baptist came to this world to prepare for Jesus. Thus, John the Baptist's role was to testify Jesus and to help others believe in Jesus Christ. However, the world did not believe in the light of the world Jesus. Isaiah had pre warned about how the people would not believe. Anyone who believes in Jesus can become God's children. John started his gospel and wrote his book in order to introduce and record Jesus Christ. Second point, St. John introduced Jesus Christ as the Lamb of God. 400 years after Malachi, a prophet finally appeared and this greatly excited the Jews. Many of them went to John the Baptist in order to repent and be baptized. The message John the Baptist had was indeed powerful and even fearful. There were many people who believed that John the Baptist was their Messiah. However, John the Baptist clearly stated that he was not the Messiah and that his role was to proclaim the coming of the Messiah. After this, Jesus appeared before John the Baptist. The moment John the Baptist saw Jesus, he said that Jesus came as the Lamb of God to take the sins away from the world. When the Jews heard this, they were extremely surprised and this was because all of them knew the tradition of the Passover and the meaning of the Lamb. When John the Baptist said that Jesus was God's Lamb, everyone knew what this meant. The story of Passover traced back to 1,500 years ago in Egypt. Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist, and then God's Spirit came upon Jesus. As John the Baptist declared, Jesus was indeed the Son of God, who came to take the sins of the world. He would be sacrificed as the Lamb. 
After this, two of John the Baptist's disciples became Jesus' disciples. Andrew was first the disciple of John the Baptist, and then he became Jesus' disciple. After Jesus called Andrew, Peter, John, and James, he then called Philip and Nathaniel. Nathaniel listened to Jesus and confessed that he was the Son of God and also the King of Israel. Jesus, hearing this, told him that he would witness greater things. Before Jesus started his public life, he lived in Nazareth, but he was not a figure of focus there, as Nazareth was just a small town. Nathaniel even said, What good can come from Nazareth? Jesus came humbly to this world and prepared for his public life in the small town of Nazareth. Third point, out of the many miracles Jesus carried out to reveal his holiness, St. John recorded seven. John recorded the seven miracles of Jesus. The first was the miracle of turning water into wine. This was when a religious symbol was made into a true blessing. The second was the healing of Herod's high official's son. This was the miracle of restoration of the body and spirit. The third was the miracle of healing a sick person who had been ill for the past 38 years. Jesus turned weakness into strength. The fourth was the miracle of feeding a large crowd. Jesus not only satisfied their physical hunger, but also their spiritual hunger. The fifth was the miracle of walking on water. Jesus changed fear to faith. The sixth was the healing of the blind man. Jesus defeated darkness and turned it into light. The seventh was resurrecting Lazarus from the dead. This miracle showed how the world could resurrect the dead. After recording Jesus' first miracle, John immediately followed up by recording Jesus' first purification of the temple. John records Jesus' purification of the temple to have been in the early days of Jesus' ministry. However, Matthew, Mark, and Luke recorded this to have been towards the end of his ministry. First point, through the conversation Jesus had with Nicodemus, he thought that one was able to gain eternal life through believing in the Son of God. John recorded the conversation Jesus had with the Pharisee Nicodemus. Nicodemus was a leader of the Jews, a Pharisee, and also a member of the Sanhedrin assembly. Nicodemus was one of the few that defended Jesus, and after Jesus died, he helped bury Jesus alongside Joseph. After witnessing Jesus' miracle, Nicodemus confessed that Jesus was the Son of God. Jesus told Nicodemus that the way to reform was to be reborn through water and the Holy Spirit. Jesus furthermore told him that the way to eternal life was to believe in the Son of God. Fifth point, John the Baptist had five perceptions about Jesus. John the Baptist was an example of a best man in the Bible. The best man is glad to see that the groom is happy. When John the Baptist saw Jesus, he knew that Jesus was the Lamb of God, who came to take the sins of the world. John the Baptist also knew that Jesus was much greater than he. Jesus was the righteous judge, as well as one who baptized the people through the Holy Spirit. John the Baptist proclaimed that Jesus came from heaven. He declared that he was born on earth, and Jesus came down from heaven. John the Baptist was a prophet, and Jesus evaluated him as the greatest man born from a woman. Day 308, John 4-6, The True Worship By solving the thirst of the Samaritan woman, who was hollow in heart, Jesus became the living water for all people. First point, the point of the conversation Jesus had with a Samaritan woman was true worship. Through Jesus, Samaria became healed after 
800 years. Jesus had a conversation with a Samaritan woman. At this time, Jesus was sitting next to a well, and he was exhausted. It was here that a Samaritan woman came to fetch some water. She had chosen the middle of the day when it was boiling hot in order to avoid others. But Jesus asked her to draw him some water. It was rare for Jews to walk into Samaria, let alone speak to a Samaritan. That is exactly why this woman chose to come outside when no one was around. Despite being embarrassed of her life, she still was proud that she was the descendant of Jacob and was waiting for the Messiah. Jesus told the Samaritan woman, who had many flaws, how she never had to be thirsty again. Jesus told her that the water he offered her could not be given by anyone else, but she could not fathom what he meant. Jesus then told her to bring her husband. Jesus knew her circumstances, and at this she called Jesus a prophet. They continued to speak about worship. Jesus taught her how she could worship God. This could be done anywhere, so long as the worshiper believed in God. This was already said through Jephaniah and Malachi. Jesus became a friend to all nations, and this included the foreign nations. Earlier on, Simeon had prayed that Jesus came to shine to the foreign nations. Jesus came and restored the Samaritans after all these years, and taught a Samaritan woman how she was to worship God. Jesus healed many people and then enabled them to come before God through his cross and resurrection. The Samaritan woman's testimony enabled Samaritans to believe in Jesus. After Jesus' conversation with the Samaritan woman, he went back into the town and then taught his disciples about to wash. After this, Jesus started his ministry in Galilee. Second point, Jesus healed a man who had been sick for 38 years and then enabled him to observe the annual festival and Sabbath. The second miracle out of the seven that John records was the miracle of Jesus healing Herod's high official's son. Jesus healed him without being near him. The high official heard and then believed Jesus and returned to his son. This was like the centurion who requested Jesus to heal his servant with words only. With this, the whole family of the high official came to believe in Jesus. John then recorded the third miracle and this was how Jesus healed a man who had been sick 38 years. This was done on Jesus' way to Jerusalem during the annual festival. This was the greatest festival and Sabbath for the man who had been ill for 38 years. However, the Jews were not happy for this man, and this was because Jesus had healed during Sabbath. As such, the Jews had a very wrong idea and understanding about the Sabbath. Jesus later met this man in the temple and had a conversation with him. Jesus told him to lead a new life as he had been forgiven. The Sanhedrin assembly used this against Jesus and planned to kill him. Despite how Jesus knew what they were thinking, Jesus declared that he was the Lord of Sabbath. This gave the Sanhedrin assembly a good reason to accuse Jesus of blasphemy. Third point, Jesus declared that the Old Testament was written to testify him. Despite knowing that the Sanhedrin assembly was finding any reason to kill him, Jesus went ahead and revealed who he was. He declared that he was the Son of God and taught them about his authority. This was that Jesus and God shared all authority. Jesus and God both have the power of resurrection. Jesus has the right to judge with the power of God 
Jesus' judgment, therefore, is the will of God, and thus, anyone who believes in Jesus is able to gain eternal life. Jesus declared that he was the Son of God, and that this was declared all throughout history. Jesus himself declared that he was the Son of God. Jesus rebuked the Sanhedrin assembly for knowing the scriptures, and knowing that they pointed to Jesus and yet refusing to believe in him. Fourth point, St. John wrote down seven ways Jesus expressed himself. From the seven miracles of Jesus, the fourth was when Jesus fed thousands of hungry people. This miracle is recorded in all four Gospels. But John's Gospel is the only one to record the story of Philip and Andrew. When Jesus told his disciples to feed the people, Andrew asked how they were physically able to do this. Philip then told Jesus that this was not feasible. Although Philip provided mathematical calculations, both he and Andrew showed little faith in Jesus. After this, John recorded Jesus' fifth miracle of walking on water. Through this, Jesus changed the fear of the disciples into faith. Following this, Jesus taught them that he was the bread of life. John recorded how Jesus introduced himself, bread of life, light of the world, gate for the sheep, good shepherd, resurrection and life, way, truth and life, and true vine. When the Jews who had known Jesus for a while heard this, they said, Is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say, I came down from heaven? And so Jesus said, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Fifth point, the people who were taught by Jesus showed two different reactions. After hearing Jesus' teaching, the people showed varied responses. First, there were some who left Jesus. They had no interest in Jesus' spiritual teaching and did not believe that Jesus was the Messiah. Second, there were those who believed in Jesus and followed him. Jesus here said that one of his disciples was the Satan. Day 309 John 7-8 Jesus and the Festival of Tanj Jesus' wise answer to those who rebuked him for embracing sinners was enough to embarrass the questioners. First point Jesus' brothers told Jesus to show them a sign that he was the Messiah when Jesus went to Jerusalem. St. John recorded Jesus during the Feast of Tabernacles in a kingdom of priests. The three annual festivals were established so that the people could come closer to God. Moreover, these festivals came to symbolize political gatherings. God through Moses commanded the people not to come empty-handed, and this was for them to show great fleas towards God for what they received. The festivals were designed to bring forth efforts and materials to God. This also involved living in temporary shelters for seven days in order to remember the days they had lived in tents in the desert. When the people of South Judah returned after 70 years in Babylon after captivity, they observed this festival. Prophet Zechariah also predicted how Christ would restore the festival. Later on, Ezra and Nehemiah also observed the festival with the people. Once the reconstruction of the Jerusalem walls was completed, all the people gathered for seven days to learn about the laws. The returned captives came to observe the festival after learning about the law. Second point, Jesus changed 
the 1,500-year tradition of a kingdom of priests to the river of life. Jesus, who came to fulfill the laws and the prophets, renewed all the annual festivals of a kingdom of priests through his cross. Jesus first kept the festival and then became the Lord over them. Jesus also changed the 1,500-year tradition of a Passover to Holy Communion during the Last Supper. Furthermore, after he ascended into heaven, Jesus poured the Holy Spirit to the people who gathered in Mark's attic, and this changed the temple into the church. As such, Jesus changed the old customs into new ones based on the church. Jesus taught that he was the living water. Jesus resurrected and saved the sinners, and he lives in us today. Third point, St. John Rico did that there are many debates about Jesus during the time. During Jesus' time, there are debates surrounding whether Jesus was the Messiah or not. There are some who believed that Jesus was the Messiah after seeing his miracles. And there were oppositely those who stated that the Messiah could not be from Galilee. The main group who declared that Jesus was not the Messiah was the high priestess. Through the temple Herod constructed for them, they were enjoying a lavish lifestyle as prestigious religious leaders, and so they felt threatened by Jesus' presence. In fact, they did not want any Messiah to come. They were far more interested in sustaining their prestige. Despite this, there was nothing they could do to Jesus immediately. There were a few among the Sanhedrin assembly, such as Joseph of Arimathea, who buried Jesus, who was one of a few good men. On one occasion, the high priests and the Pharisees commanded to arrest Jesus. However, when the men who were sent to arrest Jesus went to find him, they heard Jesus teach and became completely overtaken by his words, and so could not arrest him. This shows that even between the Pharisees, there was divided opinion about Jesus. It is such a shame that the high priests and Pharisees who rejected Jesus were unable to see the truth. First point, Jesus lost on the ground in order to calm the people who were waiting to stone the adulterous woman. One day, the teachers of the law and the Pharisees came to attack Jesus again, and this time they brought a woman who committed adultery. The law that the Pharisees pointed out was, if a man commits adultery with another man's wife, with the wife of his neighbor, both the adulterer and the adulteress are to be put to death. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees wanted to find an excuse to arrest Jesus, and so they made him face a difficult situation. At this, Jesus suddenly started to write something on the ground with his hands. And this was in order to calm down the people who had stones in their hands. The laws of Moses stated that anyone who had committed adultery was to be stoned to death. And this went against Jesus' teaching. So this could easily have turned away Jesus from the people. However, Jesus managed to solve this. After writing something on the ground, Jesus addressed the crowd. Jesus asked whether anyone there was without sin. At this, they slowly dropped their stones and left. After this, Jesus forgave the woman. Fifth point, St. John thoroughly recorded the debate Jesus had with the Jews about freedom. Despite failing every time, they tried to find a fault in Jesus. The Sanhedrin assembly continuously worked hard to find any excuse to arrest him. And this time, they opened a debate about Jesus as the light and freedom. 
To this, Jesus told them that he did not belong in the world. In other words, Jesus taught that if they did not believe in Jesus, whom God sent, they could not enter the kingdom of heaven. They continued to debate about freedom, and to them, Jesus said that they were the sons of Satan. They replied that they were the chosen people by God. Although the members of the Sanhedrin assembly spoke to Jesus face to face, they still had no faith. They were so certain about their logic and their understanding that they ultimately accused Jesus of blasphemy. Day 310, John 9-11 Jesus and Hanukkah Jesus, who loved all people, was like the shepherd who was determined to die for them and carried out his ministry faithfully. First point, faith and obedience can bring a miracle. The sixth miracle recorded in John's Gospel was about Jesus healing a blind man from birth so that he could see. The story of this miracle began with the questioning of the disciples. This question was very revealing of the common thought of the Jews at the time. Many of them believed that this ability was the result of sin. To the disciples, Jesus explained that this was not so. Jesus told them that a blind man from birth would see God's glory. Jesus said the same thing when he resurrected Lazarus from death. Here, Jesus proclaimed that he was the light of the world. This was already declared by the prophet Isaiah. As the light of the world, Jesus healed the blind man. The blind man who could not see from birth believed in Jesus and thus was able to see. His faith had restored him. As such, one person's faith can bring amazing miracles. Second point, the Pharisees who only believed in a segment of God's laws could not fully understand Jesus. When Jesus healed the man who was blind from birth, the Pharisees started to rebuke Jesus for the reason that he healed him during Sabbath. They accused him of breaking the rules about Sabbath. What made this situation serious was that the Sanhedrin assembly attacked based on the law. The parents of the blind man claimed that they did not do anything, as they feared the Sanhedrin assembly, but the man who was healed confidently proclaimed that Jesus was a prophet sent by God. Despite how the Sanhedrin assembly threatened to throw the man out from their Jewish community, he still declared that Jesus was God's prophet. Jesus said to the man, For judgment I have come into this world, so that the blind will see, and those who see will become blind. Next, Jesus rebuked the Pharisee who thought himself righteous. Third point, Jesus who came as the good shepherd claimed that he would sacrifice his life for his sheep. Jesus who was the good shepherd claimed that he was the gate for the sheep. Jesus furthermore claimed that he would give his life for the sheep. Oppositely, Jesus also spoke of the wicked shepherd. Jesus was targeting the high priests and the Pharisees, who were the most prestigious religious leaders during the time. Jesus declared that they were not good shepherds, but rather a shepherd who abandoned their sheep. This saying had its foundation in the book of Ezekiel and Jeremiah. Jesus compared the good shepherd to the bad and then outlined the characteristics of the sheep. Jesus then said that he would continue to save the remaining sheep. Jesus declared that he would not only bless the Jews but all nations. And this once again spurred the members of the Sanhedrin assembly. The reason God selected Abraham was in order to bless all nations through him. However, 
Abraham's descendants got the wrong idea and accused Jesus to have been demon-possessed. They had no interest in all nations whatsoever. They believed that as Abraham's descendants, they were special and set above other nations. Thus, they were rebuked by Jesus. Fourth point, Jesus taught at Solomon's colonnade in the Jerusalem temple. The Feast of Dedication was a festival made during the Maccabean Revolt of the Hellenistic Empire with the purpose of purifying the temple. During this festival, the people gave each other gifts and also celebrated together. It was during this festival that Jesus came to the Temple of Jerusalem and taught at Solomon's colonnade in the Jerusalem Temple. The Sanhedrin assembly requested Jesus to reveal whether he was Christ. Although Jesus had told them multiple times, they still did not believe and requested to see signs. When Jesus told them again who he was, they accused Jesus of blasphemy. Jesus then spoke again, referencing the Old Testament. After debating with the members of the Sanhedrin assembly, during the Feast of Dedication, he left Jerusalem and then went to the place where John the Baptist had baptized him and taught people there. Fifth point, Jesus revealed his powers through the resurrection of Lazarus. Now, we come to the seventh miracle recorded in John's Gospel, and this was the miracle of Lazarus' resurrection. When Jesus heard the news of Lazarus, he waited for God's time and then went to Lazarus' time. This was in order for Lazarus' resurrection to reveal God's glory. However, his disciples tried to stop him in fear for Jesus' life. Jesus told them that it was not yet time for his suffering. Jesus then revealed why he would heal Lazarus. Hearing this, the disciples plucked up their courage and followed Jesus. Jesus and his disciples arrived, and as Jesus had said, Lazarus was already dead. Lazarus' sisters were unable to conceal their grief, but in this moment, Jesus said something remarkable. Jesus revealed that Lazarus' life would be newly given by Jesus as he governed human life. Next thing they found was the resurrected Lazarus. Jesus healed countless sick people and also raised the Lazarus from the dead. When the people heard this, they were in disbelief and they all gathered around Jesus. Some people saw this and started to believe that Jesus was the Son of God. However, some people reported this to the Sanhedrin assembly. Because of this, the Sanhedrin assembly had an emergency meeting. Hearing this, the head of the assembly proclaimed to sentence Jesus to death and justified it by saying that it was for their nation. The Sanhedrin assembly presumed that Jesus would come to Jerusalem during Passover and so planned to carry out their sentence then. Day 311, John 12 to 13, Jesus and the New Command. Jesus, who loved his disciples and all the people in this world, gave them a new command, which was to love one another. First point, St. John recorded that Jesus stayed in Lazarus' house six days prior to Passover. The story of Mary who poured the perfume over Jesus' feet is recorded in both Matthew and Mark. John added the detail that this incident took place in Lazarus' house six days before Passover. It was at this point that Mary poured expensive perfume over Jesus' feet. When Judas Iscariot saw this, he rebuked her. What he did not know was that she was preparing for Jesus' funeral. Many people started to believe in Jesus after the instant of Lazarus' resurrection. However, 
This incident was a deadly turning point for the Sanhedrin assembly. The members started to scheme to kill both Jesus and Nazareth. Indeed, their behavior was disgusting. They wanted to kill so that they could maintain their prestige. All they were interested in was to stop the Jews from believing in Jesus. The next day, Jesus entered Jerusalem and thus began the final week of his public life. When Jesus entered, the crowds shouted and praised Jesus. John recorded that this was because Jesus had resurrected Lazarus. As such, Lazarus' resurrection was a huge incident leading up to Passover in Jerusalem. For the Sanhedrin assembly, Jesus' entrance into Jerusalem was the worst news. Jesus' entrance was the number one news in Jerusalem, and there was nothing the Sanhedrin assembly could do about it. Second point, St. John recorded that on the day Jesus entered Jerusalem, a lot of foreign people came to see him. Some of the Greeks, among those who went up to worship during the festival, asked Jesus' disciples whether they would be able to meet Jesus. They had heard news about Jesus and wished to meet him. When Jesus heard this, he decided that it was time to address all the foreign nations. Jesus told them, that the time for his suffering was approaching, and he told his disciples to follow him. Jesus then went to pray to God, and a voice from heaven came down to fulfill Jesus' prayer. God revealed his voice so that all the foreign people could hear, and this was to furthermore reveal Jesus' death. However, the people did not understand this. Third point, St. John recorded that despite how the Jews saw many of Jesus' miracles, they still did not believe that Jesus was the Son of God. For three years, Jesus fed, healed, taught, forgave, and prayed for the people. Consequently, there are those who believed Jesus to be Christ, and also those who refused to believe. The fact that there would be many who did not believe Jesus' signs, was predicted much earlier by the prophet Isaiah. However, there are the old Pharisees who believed in Jesus. Although they could not publicly state that they believed in Jesus due to the rebuke of the Sanhedrin assembly, there are those who secretly believed. Now, before taking the cross, Jesus addressed the public for the last time. He told the people that he came to the world in order to save all nations. Jesus added that those who did not believe in Jesus would be judged. Fourth point, St. John recorded that during the last Passover, Jesus washed all the feet of his disciples. Jesus observed the 1,500 year old tradition of Passover in the 1,000-year-old Jerusalem with his disciples. He then changed the Passover to the First Holy Communion. After opening communion, Jesus washed the feet of all his disciples. When the disciples ran away, when the high priests arrested Jesus, Jesus let them all go. Despite how they ran away during this moment, thanks to Jesus' education, they became incredibly important apostles after Jesus ascended to heaven. When Jesus washed the feet of his disciples, Peter refused to be washed by Jesus. Then Jesus replied that he and Peter would have nothing to do with each other wise. Afterwards, Jesus spoke about the betrayal of Judas Iscariot through referencing Psalms. This was so that when Judas Iscariot did indeed betray Jesus, the other disciples would come to believe Jesus all the more. Jesus encouraged his disciples for their future spreading of the gospel. Fifth point, St. John recorded 
that during the Last Supper, Jesus gave his disciples a new commandment. Jesus taught during the Last Supper. He then gave his disciples a new commandment. In the Old Testament, God gave Abraham's descendants a commandment. But now Jesus renewed this commandment and gave it as a mission to his disciples. Jesus renewed the love your neighbor as you love yourself, to love each other as I love you. After this, Jesus predicted Peter's death. Peter was not to follow Jesus to the cross immediately. Although Peter said that he would give his life for Jesus, Peter was to deny Jesus three times. However, Jesus declared that Peter would follow Jesus in the days to come. Day 312, John 14 to 15. Way, truth, life. Jesus promised that after ascending to the Father's house, the Holy Spirit as a counselor would come upon the disciples in his name. First point. Saint John recorded that during the final Passover and first communion, Jesus had a deep conversation with his disciples. Saint John thoroughly detailed how Jesus spent the last Passover with his disciples and then turned it into Holy Communion. He also recorded the content of what Jesus said to his disciples on that night. Jesus spoke about how Judas Iscariot would betray him, his death, how Peter would deny him three times as well as consoling his disciples when they worried about Jesus. To Thomas, Jesus told him that he was the way, the truth, and the life, and that no one comes to the Father except through him. As such, Jesus explained that the only way was through him. Although Jesus had told his disciples on many occasions that he and God were one, there were many, including Philip, who did not understand this. Therefore, Jesus once again told them that he and God were one and united. Therefore, those who believe in Jesus can do two things. The first is that they could do the things Jesus did and receive bigger powers. The second is to receive anything after asking it in the name of Jesus. Second point. After Jesus ascended into heaven, God sent the Holy Spirit to Jesus' disciples. Whilst observing the first Holy Communion with his disciples, he told them about the Holy Spirit. This was for them to prepare the way for the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit would come and this would mean that Jesus would dwell among them forever, as Jesus promised. Jesus told them that he would give them peace, beyond the earthly form of peace. Jesus then gave consoling words as they would be left behind. He also told them about resurrection and ascension into heaven. Third point, Jesus explained the relationship between God, Jesus, and Christians through the parable of the grape tree. Jesus spoke about the relationship between God, Jesus, and Christians. Right on, this subject was also spoken through St. Paul. The parable of the grape tree occurs frequently in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, God was the farmer, and the Israelites were the grape. The message Jesus gave to the disciples were the following. First, if they remained in Jesus and believed his words, they would be granted whatever they wished for. Second, God would receive glory from their efforts, and they would become God's disciples. Third, if they kept God's laws, they would remain in God's love. First point, God befriended Abraham and Jesus befriended his disciples. Abraham was called a righteous man of faith, and through his sacrificial acts on Mount Moriah, 
he became God's friend. As God called Abraham his friend, Jesus also called his disciples his friends. Fifth point, Jesus said that as the world rebuked Jesus, the world would also rebuke his disciples. Jesus spoke of the relationship between the disciples and the world. As the world hated Jesus, the world would also hate the disciples. Jesus' words were the fulfillment of Psalms. Jesus proclaimed that the Holy Spirit would come to them soon. Day 313, John 16-17 Jesus and the Holy Spirit With crucifixion only moments away, Jesus gave his disciples words they were to remember and pride for them to be committed to God. First point, Jesus introduced the Holy Spirit to his disciples. Before being arrested and before Jesus went to Gethsemane with a few of his disciples, his teaching continued. Jesus taught his disciples that the Holy Spirit would be with them soon. This was Jesus preparing for their days after Jesus' resurrection and ascension into heaven so that they would continuously walk for God's kingdom. Another reason Jesus told them about the Holy Spirit was because he knew that the Sanhedrin assembly's attack would continue through to the disciples after Jesus' ascension. Jesus' disciples would be exiled from the Jewish community by the Sanhedrin assembly. Some would even be killed. We know that St. Paul used to be one of the persecutors. When the disciples feared, Jesus promised them that the Holy Spirit would be with them. The Holy Spirit would come to help the sinners, realize their sins, make the righteous Christians shine through and reveal God's judgment. However, the Holy Spirit would only come after Jesus' resurrection and ascension into heaven. Second point, Jesus promised that the disciples who would face immense hardship would be given strength by God to overcome it. Jesus now officially told his disciples about his suffering on the cross as well as his resurrection. At this time, the disciples could not understand this. When they failed to understand this, Jesus used the parable of a woman giving birth in order to explain. This was to show that Jesus' death would make the disciples lament and the Sanhedrin assembly glad. But through Jesus' resurrection, the disciples would be glad again. Jesus, moreover, taught them how to pray for the day. Jesus promised that if they prayed through Jesus' name, they would be saved, blessed, and be full of joy. When the disciples confessed their faith in Jesus, Jesus told them that they would betray him. This was a reference to the words in Zechariah. However, Jesus told them that as he would be victorious, so would they. This light became the confession of the apostles. St. John confessed this as well as St. Paul. Third point, Jesus prayed for himself and also for the glory of God. Unlike other Gospels, St. John recorded Jesus' prayer before his suffering on the cross and his resurrection. Jesus first prayed for God's glory before his. This prayer was after Jesus declared that in this world you will have trouble, but take to heart I have overcome the world. This prayer contained Jesus' confirmation that the Messiah came to fulfill God's plan, and this prayer is often referred to as the prayer of the high priest. Jesus then prayed that after the cross and resurrection, God's glory would be restored again as a pre-creation. Fourth point, Jesus prayed for his disciples. Jesus' prayer continued. Jesus prayed with a happy heart for the disciples as he left them behind. But Jesus helped the disciples stay strong 
and to rely on God. Jesus then prayed for them. As Jesus and God are one, Jesus prayed for the disciples to become one. Jesus emphasized that he was the one to protect them. Jesus also prayed for them to not fall into temptation and for God to look over them. Jesus told them that although the world would hate those who are God's, God would protect his people until the end. Jesus moreover told them of the remaining mission after Jesus left. His final prayer was for his disciples to be led into the truth. Fifth point, Jesus prayed for all the people in the kingdom of God. Jesus prayed for the people in the kingdom of God. He then prayed that they would all come together to participate in God's glory. Day 314, John 18-19 The cross, the heaven's most holy place. God's plan of salvation for all humankind was finally realized through the death of Jesus Christ on the cross on the hill of Golgotha. First point, Jesus received the first trial by the Sanhedrin assembly. After observing the last Passover and the first Holy Communion, Jesus headed towards Gethsemane to pray, before the members of the Sanhedrin assembly came to arrest him. The Sanhedrin assembly had thoroughly prepared to arrest Jesus. The first step was the information given by Judas Iscariot. They even prepared the Roman soldiers as well as the equipment needed for nighttime arrest. Jesus, however, knew that all this was to happen and clearly stated that he was Jesus of Nazareth when they came. Whilst answering their questions, Jesus made room for his disciples to run away. Jesus did not want any of his disciples to be caught. As such, even in the moment, the Sanhedrin assembly came to arrest him. Jesus showed love and protection towards his disciples. When they tried to arrest Jesus, Peter stood forward, but Jesus told him to stop. Jesus was arrested and was taken to Annas. Annas was a high-ranking member of the Sanhedrin assembly and father-in-law to the high priest. Annas was also the one to question Peter in the days to come. During the time Jesus received his first trial by the high priest, Peter denied Jesus for the first time. Annas, during the trial, questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teachings. However, Jesus only answered about his teachings and did not answer about his disciples. Annas then transferred Jesus to the Sanhedrin assembly for the next trial. Second point, Jesus' cross had full background stories. Jesus was sentenced to death according to the Roman Empire's system of crucifixion. There are four reasons behind Jesus' cross. The first was because the Sanhedrin assembly wanted this sentence. The second was although the Roman governor did not want to crucify Jesus initially, he eventually ordered this. Pontius Pilate was fully aware of the jealousy that the Sanhedrin assembly had towards Jesus. At first, it was difficult as Jesus had a strong power among his followers. However, the Sanhedrin assembly turned the tables so that Pontius Pilate would fear if he did not crucify Jesus. The third was that Satan was at work. The fourth was that to their absolute surprise, the cross was God's ultimate plan for the salvation of the world. Third point, during the six hours on the cross, Jesus said seven things. Jesus said the following seven things whilst nailed to the cross. First, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Second, truly I tell you today you will be with me in paradise. Third, woman, here is your son, and here is your mother. 
False, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Fifth, I am thirsty. Sixth, it is finished. This was the proclamation of Jesus, who came to fulfill the laws and the prophets. And seventh, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Fourth point, right at the moment Jesus shouted, "It is finished!" on the cross, a kingdom of priests. Became fulfilled by the kingdom of God. Jesus breathed his last on the cross. Jesus declared, "It is finished," and this symbolized how a kingdom of priests became fulfilled by the kingdom of God. It is finished contained how Jesus fulfilled his role as the Lamb of God, and how he came as the royal priesthood in order to purify the sins of the world. Jesus' cross was heaven's most holy place. For the Jews, the most holy place was the area that housed the ark, and the design of the Jerusalem temple had been given by God to David. Thus, the most holy place in the temple had been built by man according to God's design. However, with Jesus' proclamation, the most holy place in the temple. Became the shadow of heaven's most holy place. It was no longer necessary for the high priest to enter the most holy place. Heaven's most holy place was not built by man, but had been built in heaven, and thus was not part of creation. For Christ did not enter a sanctuary made with human hands; that was only a copy of the true one. He entered heaven itself, now to appear for us in God's presence. Fifth point: Jesus' cross symbolizes God's love. Jesus' cross was the fulfillment of God's revelation, a revelation that existed before creation. Revelation means that God revealed Himself and His will. God created the world not only through causality. But beyond it, Jesus' cross was God's special revelation, and also the purpose for Jesus coming to this world. Thus, Jesus' cross was God's revelation, which had been planned prior to Genesis. When Jesus breathed his last, now what remained was his funeral. Here, Joseph, who was a member of the Sanhedrin assembly but a secret follower of Jesus, stood forward. And was given Jesus' body to be buried. Day three hundred and fifteen, John twenty two twenty one, resurrection, the greatest victory. Jesus, who rose from the dead, restored the disciples, who were mired in despair, and gave them the mission of spreading the gospel. First point: Jesus defeated death and resurrected. After three days, Jesus was buried, and then he resurrected after three days. The women went to his tomb early on the third day, but did not find him there. Mary Magdalene ran to the disciples to inform them that Jesus was not in his tomb. Although the women Peter and John saw Jesus' empty tomb, they still did not understand what was going on. It could have been that their understanding of resurrection was limited to what was written in the Old Testament. After reuniting with Jesus, they finally understood that Jesus had resurrected. The resurrected Jesus first went to Mary Magdalene. As such, Jesus resurrected after three days and became the first fruit of resurrection. The sin of Jesus' resurrection is indeed the most glorious and wonderful sin in the entire Bible. We sing of Jesus' resurrection forever. Second point: Jesus went to go see his disciples after three days. Jesus, in resurrected form, went to meet his disciples. The disciples had all run away. Full of fear, when the Sanhedrin assembly came to arrest Jesus, but Jesus came to find them, and then he showed them his resurrected form.
One disciple who was not there, Thomas, refused to believe that Jesus had risen from the dead, and swore that he would not believe until he had touched the nail marks on Jesus' hands. Jesus then had to appear in front of Thomas as well, and finally Thomas believed. Third point, St. John was able to meet the resurrected Jesus again after a long time on the island of Patmos. The reason St. John recorded John's Gospel was in order to record Jesus' seven miracles, as well as Jesus' suffering on the cross and the resurrection. St. John himself believed that Jesus was the Son of God and Christ, who came to give eternal life to all nations. In his old age, John was sent to the island of Patmos, where he recorded about the new heavens and the new earth. In Revelation, John confirmed Jesus' second coming. He who testifies to these things says, Yes, I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Fourth point, St. John recorded that the resurrected Jesus came to eat with them again, like the Last Supper he had with them during the final Passover. The resurrected Jesus firstly came to see his ten disciples, and then eight days later, he went to see Thomas. Jesus had met all his remaining disciples. Jesus separately appeared before Peter, Thomas, Nathaniel, James, John, and two others. They all met in Galilee. The resurrected Jesus met his disciples not in Jerusalem but in Galilee. Jesus told the women to tell his disciples to stay in Galilee. With his seven disciples, Jesus had something to eat. This was similar to when he ate with his disciples the night before he was crucified. Fifth point, St. John recorded that Jesus gave him and Peter a mission. Jesus, who ate with seven of his disciples, gave Peter and John a mission. He first spoke to Peter. He told Peter that he would glorify God through his death. Peter then asked Jesus about John, to which Jesus answered why Peter should care if Jesus decided to keep John alive until the last judgment, although figuratively. The last gospel, John's Gospel and is on this note. This is the disciple who testifies to these things and who wrote them down. We know that his testimony is true. Jesus did many other things as well. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that even the whole world would not have room for the books that would be written. Day 316 Acts 1 to 2. The Disciple Era. The resurrected Jesus gave his disciples hope and mission whilst promising them the Holy Spirit and commanded them to preach his love to all the nations. First point The atmosphere of the 30 years of Acts is that of opposition between the apostles and the high priests in the midst of spreading the kingdom of God. After Jesus ascended into heaven as promised, the Holy Spirit came upon the early Jerusalem church, and this spurred the Christians to love and serve one another. Acts furthermore records how the spreading of the gospel occurred from Samaria to the Andes of the earth. During the 30 years of Acts, Churches became established and thus Christians were born. During this time, there were many teams that went out to spread the gospel, and one of them was Paul's team. The Book of Acts plays an important connecting role within the New Testament. First, seen historically, Acts is in between the four gospels and the letters. Second, seen religiously, Acts bridges the Jews and the Christians. Third, in terms of God's history, Acts bridges God's laws and blessings. 
force in terms of God's people act connects the Jews to the foreigners. Fifth, in terms of God's plan, acts bridges a kingdom of princes and the kingdom of God. Second point, Jesus, who started his public life by fasting for 40 days, stayed with his disciples for 40 days after resurrecting and taught them about the kingdom of God. Luke connected the acts to the message of Luke's gospel. After Jesus ascended to heaven, the disciples waited for Jesus to send the Holy Spirit to them. The reason they were able to do so was through Jesus' teaching for the past three years about the Holy Spirit. Thus, as they promised Jesus, they waited for the Holy Spirit to dwell among them. Jesus taught his disciples to wait for the Holy Spirit and also taught them about his second coming. Jesus emphasized that no one knew the time for Jesus' second coming other than God. The disciples who now wholeheartedly believed in Jesus became his witnesses. Their mission was to spread to all nations what they had seen and experienced for the past three years with Jesus and to ultimately live as Christians. The disciples were to become apostles and to first take on Jesus' yoke and learn. Second, they were to take their cross and follow Jesus. Third, they were not to leave Jerusalem and to wait for what God had promised. Fourth, they were to become Jesus' witnesses. And finally, they were to make disciples of all nations and to teach them the gospel. Third point, as the Mana generation were formed after 40 years in the desert, the disciple generation began after three years of Jesus' public life. The Mana generation were born from the hard works of Moses. Jesus also formed the disciple generation after three years. After Jesus ascended into heaven, the disciples waited for a few days in Jerusalem and prayed together. With the official formation of the disciple generation, they put together a network. The first of this involved replacing Judas Iscariot, who had betrayed Jesus. And the disciples, who had become apostles, started to search for someone to replace Judas Iscariot. Peter replied to what was written. He had learned this from Jesus during the past three years. Indeed, this was Peter referring to the Old Testament. We can see just how thoroughly the disciples were educated during the past three years from Jesus. Jesus said it is written many times. To look at a few, it was said during the Last Supper. It was also said to predict Peter's denial of Jesus. It was said right after Jesus was arrested in Gethsemane. As such, Jesus ministered according to the records. At last, the apostles found the person to replace Judas Iscariot. The two contenders were Matthias and Joseph, and the apostles all prayed before ultimately selecting Matthias. Fourth point. God's Holy Spirit came upon the disciples in the attic of Marcus' house rather than the Jerusalem temple. At last, the Holy Spirit that Jesus promised and the apostles most anxiously waited for finally came to Mark's attic. The reason the Holy Spirit came to Mark's attic rather than the Jerusalem temple was because when Jesus shouted, It is finished on the cross, the curtains of the temple ripped in half, which officially ended the function of the temple. This was the fulfillment of the words written in Isaiah and Joel. Fifth point, after the disciples received the Holy Spirit, the Jerusalem church began spreading God's word. When the people heard Peter's message, they all felt guilt in their hearts. Peter then told them to repent 
in order to become holy people in the kingdom of God. They first had to repent, be baptized, receive forgiveness, and then be gifted the Holy Spirit. After hearing Peter's message, 3,000 people repented in Jerusalem. Finally, the people whose bodies had become the temple of Christ gathered to form the early Jerusalem church. The early Jerusalem church was a place where people gathered to pray. It was also where many markers were revealed. It was also where the people brought all the goods together to share. It was where the people gathered to worship God and to love one another. Day 317, Acts 3-5, the Second Sanhedrin Assembly. The early Jerusalem church began and the disciples who received the Holy Spirit performed miracles in the name of Jesus and preached the gospel. First point, Peter proclaimed that Jesus came to the world as predicted by the prophets at Solomon's colonnade in the Jerusalem temple. Peter and John went together to the Jerusalem temple in order to pray together. When they found a man who could not walk sitting near the door of the temple, they healed him in the name of Jesus. They were able to heal in the name of Jesus as taught by Jesus. When the people gathered, Peter gave his second public speech, following his first during Pentecost. To the people, Peter said, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us as if by our own power or godliness we had made this man walk? Peter very clearly stated that the power was given by Jesus Christ. Peter then rebuked the sins of the Jews for killing Jesus and then testified Jesus' resurrection. Peter also emphasized that the healing of the man was done in the name of Jesus Christ. Peter moreover told the people who had gathered there to repent and to be forgiven of their sins. Peter declared that Jesus was the Messiah who had come to the world, as predicted by all the prophets since Samuel. Jesus had come to the Jews first, who were the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, as promised by God. As such, Jesus had been predicted by the prophets, and through Jesus, their words were fulfilled. Second point, Peter and John received their trial by the Sanhedrin assembly, where Jesus also received his trial. With the healing of the man who could not walk, Peter and John became the center of the people's attention. Furthermore, when Peter stood at Solomon's colonnade in the Jerusalem temple and confidently declared and testified Jesus, this of course captured the interest of the high priests and the Sadducees. When Peter started to catch the attention of the diaspora Jews, who were the ultimate VIP in Jerusalem for shopping in the court of the Gentiles, this really became a problem for the high priests. The Jerusalem temple was marked by 71 members of the Sanhedrin assembly who enjoyed enormous prestige from the temple. They were the ones who believed that the temple belonged to them. The apostles came marching into the temple and testified Jesus' resurrection. Consequently, the Sadducees arrested the apostles and kept them till the morning. However, before being arrested, the apostles had converted 5,000 people into believers of Jesus through their testimony. Because of this, the Sanhedrin assembly decided to hold an urgent meeting and to furthermore open a trial. The opening of the second trial was in itself an insult to the Sanhedrin assembly. This was because they had already had the first trial with Jesus. And now things had taken its toll. They were furious for having to open a second trial. When the Sanhedrin assembly arrested Jesus, the disciples were so afraid that they all ran away. Peter, who watched the trial from a distance, ended up denying Jesus three times out of fear. Day 
Their behavior was so pitiful that the Sanhedrin assembly did not feel the need to arrest the disciples. However, these disciples completely changed and became an increasing threat to the Sanhedrin assembly. Thus, they had to open a second trial, which was really not something they wanted to do. Third point. During the trial by the Sanhedrin assembly, Peter testified that Jesus had resurrected. The first Sanhedrin assembly trial was the trial of Jesus, and it occurred during Passover. The second Sanhedrin assembly trial was the trial of the apostles, and this occurred right after Pentecost. The trial began with the questioning from the assembly members. When they started questioning the apostles and created an atmosphere of fear, Peter replied confidently. This, of course, shocked the Sanhedrin assembly. According to their information, the apostles were the disciples of Jesus who did not have much knowledge or courage to stand before the assembly. When Peter started his public speech, they had to proclaim him innocent. However, the assembly threatened the apostles to stop spreading the word of Jesus. To them, Peter declared that he would continue to spread the word of Jesus no matter what. Fourth point, the early church testified Jesus' resurrection and witnessed miracles. After the trial by the Sanhedrin assembly, the apostles were set free, and they returned to the Jerusalem church to report all that had happened. Afterwards, the people in the church all gathered to pray. Amazingly, after the second trial by the Sanhedrin assembly, the believers in Jesus increased from 3,000 to 5,000. This was when the Jerusalem church came together to witness miracles. When financial difficulties struck the Jerusalem church, a man named Joseph, who was called Barabbas, sold all his possessions and offered it to the church. Unfortunately, the incident of Ananias and Sapphira also occurred. Among the church community was a man named Ananias who tricked the people to gain honor. Because of this, he and his wife died. Fifth point, due to the jealousy of the Pharisees, the apostles received their third trial by the Sanhedrin assembly. The third Sanhedrin assembly trial opened, and this was because the high priests and Sadducees were jealous of the apostles. However, before the start of the trial, the apostles were rescued. The Lord's angel appeared before them and opened the doors of their cells, and this was so that they could go to the Jerusalem temple and spread the living word to the people. The apostles went to the Jerusalem temple, and rather than running away, they once again taught the people about Jesus' cross and resurrection, which of course completely set off the Sadducees. The situation was similar to when Jesus was around. The apostles were followed and supported by the people, and this increasingly threatened the Sanhedrin assembly. The Sanhedrin assembly once again dragged the apostles to court and the high priest started questioning them. To his questions, Peter and the other apostles answered. They repeated what was said during the second trial. This completely set off the Sanhedrin assembly and they shouted to kill the apostles. Here, a member of the assembly called Gamaliel came forward. The third assembly ended with the apostles being flogged. Like the first time, the apostles were threatened to stop spreading the word of Jesus. The beating that the apostles received was different from the ones that Jesus received. Jesus received the punishment according to the Roman Empire, and the apostles received the punishment according to the laws written in Deuteronomy. The apostles, however, rejoiced as they had been counted worthy of suffering for Jesus.
Day 318, Acts 6 to 9. Paul's life changing moment. Through the steps of the early church, who was scattered to avoid persecution, the gospel continued to spread far and wide. First point In order to solve the internal conflict that occurred in the Jerusalem church, the apostles appointed seven people to look over internal affairs. Despite how the results of the third Sanhedrin assembly trial was the flogging of the apostles, the Jerusalem church expanded all the more as the days went by. Although the threats from the Sanhedrin assembly was tolerable, what was intolerable was the internal conflict that arose within the church. Despite how the apostles worked hard for peace, they needed more assistance and help. The Hellenistic Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. Therefore, the apostles took this to heart and tried their best to solve this. This divide caused some quarrels within the community, as they started to certainly acknowledge their differences. The apostles discussed what could be done about this and came up with a solution. They decided to appoint seven leaders among the people, who are known to be full of spirit and wisdom, and were also acknowledged by the community. We later learned that these seven workers served the community perfectly and that they also worked relentlessly to spread Jesus' word. Among the seven were Stephen and Philip. The seven workers were collaboratively selected by the church. The apostles were able to concentrate on praying and spreading the gospel and the appointed seven workers were able to serve the church community. This brought about even people from the Jerusalem temple to confess that Jesus was Christ. Second point, the Sanhedrin assembly opened a forced trial in order to arrest Stephen. During the first Sanhedrin assembly trial, the trial was passed to Pontius Pilate who eventually sentenced Jesus to death. During the second trial, the apostles were threatened to stop proclaiming the word of Jesus. During the third trial, the disciples were flogged. Now, the Sanhedrin assembly prepared for the fourth trial. This time, they targeted Stephen, and so they found an excuse to arrest him. When the diaspora Jews were unable to win Stephen in debate, they passed him to the Sanhedrin assembly who arrested him, and thus began the fourth trial by the Sanhedrin assembly. However, this was not a righteous trial by any means. They hired people to make false accusations. The Sanhedrin assembly accused Stephen of blasphemy, as they had done to Jesus and sentenced Stephen to be stoned to death. This sentence became implemented on the spot. To their surprise, whilst being stoned, Stephen looked peaceful and angelic. Third point, Stephen declared the story of Jesus from the Old Testament to his resurrection through the tongue message to the Sanhedrin assembly. This was the order of Stephen's trial and death sentence. When the trial began, the assembly chair asked Stephen whether the contents of his arrest were true. Stephen began to speak. However, rather than defending himself, he used the time to teach the members of the Sanhedrin assembly about Jesus by referencing the Old Testament through the tongue method. This was because although they knew about the Old Testament, they had misunderstood it. Stephen managed to tell the full story without a single mistake. Most unfortunately, the people were unable to accept this story. 
Stephen started his story by tracing up to Abraham. He then explained the patriarchs and followed through to Joseph, who led Abraham's descendants into Egypt. Stephen then told the story of Moses, who was 500 years after Abraham's time, and how he led the people out of Egypt. Stephen then explained how the Israelites had to stay in the desert for 40 years because of their disobedience. He then explored how the ark moved around for 500 years and then came to settle in Jerusalem for 1,000 years. Stephen went on to explain how the Israelites worshipped idols for 500 years. Stephen started with Abraham and then through to Solomon's temple and then came to the waters of Isaiah, which he used for his main point. He declared that the whole of the Old Testament predicted Jesus and rebuked the Sanhedrin assembly for worshipping the temple itself rather than God. Stephen then came to his conclusion. Stephen declared that their disobedient ancestors killed the prophets, and the disobedient members of the Sanhedrin assembly killed Jesus. He rebuked them for killing the Messiah and for not accepting the gospel. The Sanhedrin assembly could not tolerate this. Although they knew in their hearts that they were wrong, they did not repent until the end, and sentenced Stephen to death. Stephen was accused of blasphemy. Thus, Stephen became the first martyr for Christianity. Stephen's last prayer was the prayer of Jesus whilst he was on the cross. First point, after the matter of Stephen, Philip, who was one of the seven workers, went to the Samaritan castle in order to spread the word of Jesus. After stoning Stephen to death, the Sanhedrin assembly started to relentlessly persecute Christians. Saul, who was a member among them, found it most adequate that Christians were persecuted. When the persecution became severe, some followers of Jesus ran away to Samaria and other places. But the amazing thing was that these people who ran away to Samaria was assisted by the Holy Spirit, which meant that the gospel spread throughout Samaria. Stephen's matter enabled Christianity to spread even further and became the first step towards Jesus' great commission. As the church lamented whilst burning Stephen, Saul, on the other hand, was hard at work to see the Christians. However, no one could stop the gospel from spreading. One example was how Philip spread the gospel in Samaria. Right on, Philip listened to the Lord's angel and went to the desert in order to further spread the gospel. Indeed, he had started to spread the gospel to the Andes of the earth. Philip's missionary continued their own. Fifth point, Jesus waited for Stephen on the right side of God and then waited for Saul when he was on his way to Damascus. Saul was on his way to Damascus in order to officially persecute Christians. He received an official decree from the high priest in order to go after Christian leaders such as Stephen. The Sanhedrin assembly at the time controlled 460 to 480 synagogues in Jerusalem alone. The synagogues were used by the Jews to practice their religion. Saul was on his way to Damascus in order to find the Christian leaders. This was where he met Jesus, his Damascus moment. Day 319, Acts 10 to 12. Cornelius, full of the Holy Spirit. Peter broke down his bias of chosen people only through meeting Cornelius and came to realize the fact that the gospel was the gift for all people. First point. Luke introduced Cornelius to Theophilus, who was a Roman centurion. In Luke's gospel, 
Locke introduced an honest centurion in Capernaum to Theophilus. In Acts, Luke once again introduced another centurion to Theophilus. A shocking thing was that a centurion of the Roman Empire called Cornelius lived a life of worship and prayer to God. Cornelius was a righteous man whose entire family believed in God. He helped many people and always prayed to God. As such, God showed him a vision. The day after God showed a vision to Cornelius, God also showed three visions to Peter. In the vision God showed Peter, he told him to eat foods that were forbidden in the law. Peter was to break God's law, as this was God's command. Peter had not yet realized that with the death of Jesus, a new covenant and law had been established. Whilst Peter was thinking about this vision, some men came to Peter who were sent by Cornelius. When Peter hesitated, the Holy Spirit came upon him to tell him to go with them. Second point, Peter met Cornelius and then realized the meaning of all nations. Peter arrived in the house of Cornelius. Cornelius stood before Peter and bowed down. This was a way of welcoming Peter with all his heart. Seen from the outside, it was unthinkable to see a centurion of a Roman Empire bowing down to one of their colonized people. When the two men met, they both spoke about their visions. The Jews at the time did not welcome Samaritans or foreigners into their community. However, Peter, who was a Jew, met with both Samaritans and foreigners as he realized that God does not judge a person by their appearance. Peter's realization was later recorded by St. Paul. Per Cornelius' request, Peter started to speak about Jesus. This started the spreading of the Gospels to all nations. This had already been predicted by Jesus. Before this, Peter also lived with a prejudice against the foreigners and Samaritans. However, he managed to break this and open the door for all nations to receive the gospel. When Peter saw that the Holy Spirit came upon Cornelius' family, he baptized them in the name of Jesus. As such, through meeting Cornelius, Peter came to realize the mission of spreading the gospel to all nations. Third point, Peter reported to the Jerusalem church that the presence of the Holy Spirit came to Cornelius and his family. When news broke out that Peter met with Cornelius and baptized his family, the circumcised Jews started to rebuke Peter. Peter therefore explained himself to them. Peter calmly explained to the Jews and added the words that the angel said to Cornelius. After hearing Peter's explanation, the people accepted that the gospel was to spread to all nations. The Jerusalem church decided to obey God in helping all nations to repent and accepting Jesus' gospel. This later became part of the law in the Jerusalem assembly. Fourth point, the Jerusalem church sent Peter and John to spread the word in Samaria and then sent Barnabas to Antioch. After the incident with Cornelius, the Jerusalem church rejoiced and stayed close together despite the threats from the Sanhedrin assembly. They rejoiced even further when they heard the news that the gospel had spread to Antioch. With the Sanhedrin assembly's threat, this made the Christians spread out into various areas which began to accept the gospel. When they heard this news, they sent Barnabas to Antioch, as they had sent Peter and John to Samaria. Barnabas was a man from Cyprus and was a descendant of Levi. His real name was Joseph, but people called him Barnabas. He was the one who sold all of his possessions in order to financially support the Jerusalem church 
He was also the uncle of Mark, who opened his attic for service to God. Barnabas was also the one who recommended Paul to the Jerusalem church. He connected the Jerusalem church and the Antioch church, and was also the man who joined Paul in his first missionary journey. He trained Mark and likely encouraged him to record Mark's gospel. Later on, Paul asked for Mark as he had become useful to his missionary. Fifth point, in order to win over the members of the Sanhedrin assembly, Herod Agrippa the first martyred John's brother James. With the martyr of Stephen, the church members had to scatter and after some time, Herod Agrippa the first killed James by the sword, which started the harsher persecution of Christians. Herod wished to gain support from the Jews and so started rebuking the Christians. He killed James and also locked Peter in prison. Peter was locked for the third time, the first two times being by the Sanhedrin assembly. Herod Agrippa I planned to hold the trial of Peter after Passover and to keep him in prison until then and by doing so satisfy the Jews. When James was martyred and Peter was locked in prison, the only thing the Jerusalem church could do was to pray. The night before Herod planned to hold Peter's trial, the Lord's angel came and set Peter free. With the help of the angel, Peter was able to come out. After this, Herod was put to death. At this point, Barnabas and Paul set out to Antioch. Due to the famine that struck, the Jerusalem church faced great difficulty, and thus the Antioch church sent aid to Jerusalem. This became the job of Paul and Barnabas. Later on, Barnabas and Paul, along with Mark, returned again to Antioch. Antioch thereafter became the central hub for the spreading of the gospel. Day 320 Acts chapter 13 to chapter 15, verse 35. The Jerusalem Council. The full-scale ministry of evangelism was launched, with Paul and Barnabas as leaders, as also raised by the Jerusalem Council. First point. The Jerusalem Church and Antioch Church helped one another. Due to threats from the Sanhedrin Assembly, Paul fled to his hometown and stayed there for some time. Whilst he was there, he was called again after the wonderful news broke out that people in Antioch accepted the gospel of Jesus. A new church had been born. Antioch was a coastal city located near the Mediterranean Sea and the Antioch church was made up of people of various backgrounds. As the Jerusalem church had previously sent Peter and John to Samaria, they sent Paul and Barnabas to Antioch. Barnabas stopped by to pick up Paul on his way to Antioch, and together they spent a year strengthening Antioch church. The Antioch church provided aid to the Jerusalem church when they suffered immensely from famine. It had grown into a center for world mission within a year of being founded. As such, Paul and Barabbas spent two years on their first missionary journey, and they helped the churches in Asia Minor grow in the name of Jesus Christ. During their journey, the issue of circumcision of foreigners broke out. And so, Paul and Barnabas went to Jerusalem for a while and then returned again to Antioch. The apostles all gathered for the Jerusalem Council in order to come to the best conclusion. They concluded that the gospel of Jesus Christ was for all nations and was to be spread to the ends of the earth and that circumcision should not get in the way. The Jerusalem Church and Antioch Church grew into one body in Jesus Christ. Second point. Among the numerous missionary teams, Luke recorded Paul's case as a sample in the book of Acts. 
There are many missionary groups during this time. But Luke recorded acts around his team, which was Paul's team. It is important to remember that many teams went on missionary journeys. First was Peter's journey to Samaria. He crossed the river as well as other regions and foreign lands. The second was Philip's missionary journey. Philip also went to Samaria, then to Gaza, then to Azotus and the other cities and Caesarea. Third was Barnabas' missionary journey. He was sent by the Jerusalem church to Antioch and then went on his missionary journey with Paul and afterwards with Mark. Fourth was Paul's missionary journey. Paul went on three separate missionary journeys and also went to Jerusalem and then planned to go to the Andes of the earth through Rome. Fifth was St. John's missionary journey. We can predict that many others went on missionary journeys. We need to remember that Luke recorded Paul's case as a sample to Theophilus. Third point, Paul and Barnabas were sent out by the Antioch church on their first missionary journey, which lasted approximately two years. Paul and Barnabas spent two years during their first missionary journey, and this was between AD 46 and AD 48. The region was mostly Asia Minor. Mark, Barnabas's nephew, also joined the team, and together they took a boat to Seleucia, and then to Cyprus, which was the hometown of Barnabas. Paul and Barnabas arrived in Cyprus and then went to a place called Salamis, where they found a synagogue to preach the gospel. At first, they used the synagogues to teach the Jews, but the foreigners started to come, and so the gospel reached many more people. However, towards the west of Cyprus, in a place called Paphos, they also came across a Jewish sorcerer and false prophet named Bar Jesus. Later, Paul's team went towards Perga, but it was here that Mark left them to return to Jerusalem. And so Paul and Barnabas headed towards Pisidia, Antioch. Paul went to the synagogue and was given a chance to preach the gospel there. Paul, therefore, started with the incident of Exodus and then came to the story of Jesus. And many people listened with interest. However, the Jews who were there were jealous of Paul and Barnabas and so forced them to leave. Paul and Barnabas experienced what Jesus had told his disciples that the people would not listen. They had to leave Pisidia and Antioch and next, they headed towards Iconium. Afterwards, they headed towards Lystra. And here, Paul healed a man who could not walk from birth. Because of this, the people there perceived Barnabas as Jews and Paul as Hermes, and started to make offerings to them. Barnabas and Paul tore their robes and testified that the miracle was performed in the name of God. The Jews who had interrupted Paul and Barnabas in Pisidia and Antioch and Iconium followed them to Lystra and stoned Paul. They thought that Paul had died and so left him there. After almost being stoned to death in Lystra, Paul regained his strength and headed towards Derby. It is likely that whilst being stoned, Paul thought of Stephen's matter. Paul and Barabbas then returned to all the places they visited and asked the people to pray for them. Next, they went to Pamphylia and spread the gospel there and then headed towards Atalia. They then sent a report to Antioch Church to stress that God had opened the doors regarding the issues of boldness. After doing so, Paul and Barabbas went to Jerusalem in order to solve the issue of circumcision of the foreigners, and they went to meet the elders. Indeed, Paul and Barnabas covered a lot of areas in Asia Minor during their first missionary journey. Fourth point, 
the Antioch Church decided to receive a trial from the Jerusalem Council concerning the issue of circumcision for foreigners. After Paul and Barnabas ended their first missionary journey, the issue of circumcision of foreigners broke out in Antioch Church. The Antioch Church members, however, did not want to listen to Paul and Barnabas' teaching about only Jesus. This was because they believed the circumcision to be a holy tradition. This issue grew serious, and so Paul and Barnabas decided to go to Jerusalem Church to get to the bottom of it. The Antioch Church sent Paul and Barnabas as well as a few others to Jerusalem, including Titus. Paul and Barnabas, on their way to Jerusalem, visited Phoenicia, as well as Samaria, to spread the gospel. Fifth point, the Jerusalem Council came to the conclusion that salvation was only granted through Jesus' cross. Now, the historical event of the Jerusalem Council opened. The chair of this council was Jesus' brother James, and in this meeting, Paul and Barabbas reported their first missionary journey. After they reported all their actions and opened the discussion about the circumcision, those who converted from being Pharisees to Christians had a lot to say. They emphasized that foreigners who came to believe in Jesus must also keep Moses' laws and become circumcised. Then Peter lapped up with his speech. The chair of the council, James, made the following conclusions. The first was that the church was not to pick on the non-circumcised. The second was for church members to abstain from idol sacrificed food, from the meat of strangled animals, and from sexual immorality. Ultimately, the conclusion made from the first meeting of the Jerusalem Council was that salvation was only in the cross of Jesus Christ. This was firstly so that the entire church could become one. Secondly, the 2,000-year tradition of circumcision came to a stop. Thirdly, the gospel was to be spread to all nations. Fourthly, the early church declared that the only important thing was the cross of Jesus Christ. They emphasized that it was wrong to dishonor the meaning of Jesus' cross. In addition, the Jerusalem Council finally agreed unanimously to elevate Paul to the status of Barnabas. Day 321, Acts chapter 15, verse 36 to chapter 18, verse 22. Paul's second missionary journey. Paul, who separated with Barnabas, preached the gospel in the regions of Macedonia together with new fellow workers and experienced the power of the gospel even in the midst of much persecution. First point, with the official approval and love from the Jerusalem Council, Paul formulated his own team and set out for his second missionary journey. Paul and Barabbas returned to Antioch after the Jerusalem Council meeting came to an end, and they all the more passionately taught the people about the cross and resurrection of Jesus Christ. After spending a few days, Paul suggested to Barnabas to go on their second missionary journey. Despite almost dying and all the extremely difficult times they encountered during the first journey, Paul wished to return to all the places they visited. However, a debate broke out between the two, and this concerned Mark. Mark had set off with them during the first journey, but came back to Jerusalem halfway. Barnabas wished to take Mark with them again and give him a second chance, but Paul was against this idea. They were unable to come to an agreement about this and decided to go their separate ways. If Paul did not receive an official acknowledgement from the Jerusalem Council, he would not have been able to form his own team and go. Concerning Mark, we later learn that 
When Paul was alone before being sentenced to death, he sent for Mark, and he was useful to his ministry. This shows that Mark did outstandingly well during his second missionary journey with Barnabas. Mark later wrote Mark's Gospel. Second point, Paul revisited the places of his first missionary journey and updated them on the decisions made by the Jerusalem Council in order to give them encouragement and support. Paul set out on his second missionary journey with Silas, and he revisited Derby and then Lystra, where he had encountered a great deal of difficulty during his first journey. Here they met Timothy, and he became Paul's disciple. Timothy's father was Greek, and his mother was a Jew. Timothy received the finest education from his parents, and he was highly prized in Lystra and Iconium. Paul added Timothy to their missionary team and made sure that no rumors went around about his parentage concerning circumcision. With Timothy on their team, Paul set out again to the places he visited during his first missionary journey, and then updated the people about the decisions made in the Jerusalem Council. This increased the number of people who confessed Jesus Christ as the Messiah. Third point, Paul's missionary team was led by the Holy Spirit to go preach the gospel in Europe. Although Paul planned to visit more areas within the boundaries of Asia Minor, the Holy Spirit did not immediately permit this. The Holy Spirit instead led him to where he was most needed. In Troas, Paul was given a vision to go to Macedonia. In Troas, Luke joined Paul's missionary team. What started off with two members grew into four, and through the leading from the Holy Spirit, the team went from Asia Minor to Macedonia. They arrived in Philippi, where they met Lydia, a dealer of purple cloth. Paul preached in Philippi, and the Philippian church came to be a big support of Paul in the days to come. During his time there, Paul killed a female servant who was a fortune teller from being demon-possessed, but because of this, the owner of that servant reported this to the Roman soldiers, and so he was flogged and sent to prison. But God gave a miracle in this prison in order to save the jailer. Through this, Paul and Silas were able to preach the gospel to the jailer. Fourth point. During Paul's second missionary journey, he established the church in Philippi and then wanted to spread the gospel in Thessalonica, Berea, and Athens. Paul's team spread the gospel to Lydia and her family, as well as the jailer, and then founded the Philippian church. Afterwards, they headed to Thessalonica. Here, they preached the gospel to many Greeks and a few prominent women. However, Paul's team was unable to stay here for a long time due to the jealous Jews. Next, they went to Berea where they came across more people who accepted the gospel. However, the Jews came after Paul's team to Berea to interrupt their ministry. Because of this, Paul left Silas and Timothy in Berea and fled first. Paul left Macedonia and then went to Athens. Athens was a place full of idols, but despite so, Paul and Luke headed towards the synagogue and preached the gospel in the marketplace every day. Paul preached that God is the creator. All humans are God's creation. Jesus Christ died on the cross and resurrected, and that we all had to repent of our sins. When the people of Athens heard this, he did not show a good response. Thus, Paul left Athens. Although Paul did not have good results in Athens, he decided that he would, from now on, only deliver the message of Jesus' cross. Fifth point. During Paul's second missionary journey, he stayed in Corinth 
for a year and six months and sent two letters to Thessalonica. Paul left Athens and then headed towards Corinth. In Corinth, Paul met Priscilla and Aquila. During this time, the Roman Empire was under the rule of the false emperor Claudius. And because he commanded the exile of the Jews, Priscilla and Aquila were lodging in Corinth. Like Paul, they made a living by making tents. Whilst in Corinth, Paul went to the synagogue every Sabbath and preached the gospel. Around this time, Silas and Timothy, who had been in Berea, came to join Paul, and together they started their missionary in Corinth. Silas did the preparations to get financial help from the Philippian church. Timothy brought bank news from Thessalonica, and here Paul wrote one and two Thessalonians. When the results from Corinth were not as successful as he had hoped, Paul was in despair. However, the Lord sent him a vision to console him and told Paul that the people in Corinth were also the Lord's people. Therefore, Paul stayed in Corinth for a year and a half and established the Corinthian church. With this, Paul closed his second missionary journey. Before setting out on his third missionary journey, Paul firstly shaved his head. Secondly, he spent some time in Ephesus and spread the gospel there. Later, during his third missionary journey, he returned to Ephesus and spent around three years there. Thirdly, he reported the contents of his journey back to the Jerusalem church. Day 322, 1 Thessalonians 1-5 teachings on Jesus' second coming and resurrection. Paul exalted the Thessalonian church like a father in his letter of praise and joy for their belief in the gospel even amidst affliction. First point, many letters can be found in the Bible. When writing a letter, first, the person you are writing to must be made clear. Second, depending on whom you are writing to, the manner of the writing is bound to change. Third, information is added, such as the date of the lecture, introduction, some form of conclusion, etc. Fourth, the content should be practical. Fifth, the letter is either a public one or a private one. Paul wrote many letters during his missionary in order to persuade, to report, and to inform various people. Second point, during Paul's second missionary journey, he wrote one and two Thessalonians, and also Galatians. To summarize Paul's letters, they are letters of blessing and peace. Paul used these words multiple times, and this was most likely a reference to the blessings used by a high priest Aaron 1,500 years ago. Thessalonica was a place where one of Alexander's soldiers came after Alexander's death and named the city after his wife. Many Greeks and Macedonians at the time lived there, as well as Romans and Jews. As the diaspora Jews lived there, many synagogues existed. Paul's team was only able to spend three weeks in Thessalonica. But Paul heard the news that despite their short stay and persecution from the Jews, they were keeping their faith strong. And so Paul sent them an encouraging letter. He wrote that he was proud of them and encouraged them to have faith in the everlasting kingdom of God. Third point, Paul wrote that he had to leave Thessalonica due to the persecution from the Jews. The writers of Thessalonians were Paul, Silas, and Timothy, and the ones receiving the letter were the church members of the Thessalonian church. After greeting them, Paul wrote them encouraging words. Paul expressed happiness towards the people who were keeping their faith strong, despite how the Jews were persecuting them. Paul outlined that the Thessalonian church disposed of all the idols, and then repented and came to God. Day 323, 
they also worship the gods and hope and wait for the second coming of Jesus. Paul expressed his joy in his letter and reminisced on how he preached the gospel in Thessalonica despite persecution. Paul emphasized that he preached them the gospel for God's joy. Paul also wrote that he passionately wished to preach the gospel to them. In order to preach them the gospel, Paul's team nursed them like a mother, did their best not to become a burden to anyone, were righteous and blameless, and encouraged, comforted, and urged them to live in the kingdom of God. Paul wrote that he wished to meet them again. Although he had previously tried to visit them again, due to many interruptions and persecution, he had been unable to. Fourth point, Paul sent Timothy to Thessalonica and heard their news through him. The reason Paul came to write Thessalonians was because whilst he and Luke were in Athens, he became very worried about the church, and so he asked Timothy who was in Berea to go and see how they were doing. Thankfully, Timothy came back with good news that they were doing well and keeping their faith strong. Paul asked Timothy, who was in Berea, to go to Thessalonica, as he wanted to ensure that their faith did not waver, and that Paul's previous efforts in preaching them the gospel did not go to waste. Paul advised the church to live a righteous life before God. The Thessalonian church was able to learn about being in Christ, and with Christ through Paul and his team. Therefore, the church lived a holy life and loved one another. Fifth point, Paul taught the Christians at Thessalonica about ascension and also resurrection so that they could live in hope. Paul taught the Thessalonian church about Jesus' second coming and resurrection so that they would live with hope. He hoped that they would console and encourage one another. It was also partly because he was only able to spend three weeks with them. In his letter, he asked them to always work hard in Christ. He also prayed for them. Paul added that there was nothing he had to say about when Jesus would come again as only God knew. Thus, he told them to always be alert. Paul asked for his letter to be read to the church, meaning that his letter was officially a public statement. Day 323, 2 Thessalonians 1-3 The right attitude to have about Jesus' second coming and the end. Paul taught responsibility to those who neglected their work, thinking that Jesus would come right away. First point, Paul started off to Thessalonians by warmly encouraging the church members. Two Thessalonians was written in order to set the record straight about the second coming of Jesus, but before rebuking the church members about their misunderstanding, Paul first started his letter by encouraging them. The reason Paul encouraged them was firstly because their faith had matured greatly. Secondly, the church members had a great deal of love for others. Thirdly, despite the persecution they were receiving, they still kept their faith strong. Second point, Paul told the heavily persecuted Thessalonian church that they would be rightfully honored by God. At the time, the Thessalonian church was heavily persecuted by those who drove Paul out in three weeks. Despite so, they kept their faith strong and persevered. Thus, Paul told them that he was proud of them and that these times of persecution was temporarily a test. He told them to pray to God for protection and to remember that there are people such as Paul who prayed for them from afar. Third point, Paul taught the Thessalonian church about the right attitude regarding Jesus' second coming. 
Paul taught the members of the Thessalonian church about the right attitude regarding Jesus' second coming and also concerning the end of the world. The reason Paul wrote them a second letter was so that they did not misunderstand or fear the end of the world. Some of the members of the church misunderstood after reading Paul's first letter to them that Jesus' second coming was to happen soon and so they consequently started to let go of their daily activities, thinking that there was no point. Thus, Paul wrote a second letter to them to reproach this irresponsible attitude. Fourth point, Paul taught the Thessalonian church about how to biblically prepare for Jesus' second coming. Paul wrote that in the last moment, big and dark spirits would come to seduce them. In order to prepare against such a moment, they were to strengthen their faith through the Bible. Paul taught them that the only way for them not to waver was through the Bible. Paul, who prayed for the Thessalonian church, now asked them to pray for his missionary team. He asked them to firstly pray that the gospel would spread as it had spread to them. Secondly, he asked them to pray for his missionary team members. Fifth point, Paul warned the people who had a misunderstanding about Jesus' second coming. Paul taught the Thessalonian church about how they were to live as Christians. This was the key reason as to why he wrote the second letter. They had misunderstood Paul's words about Jesus' second coming and thus became lazy. Paul firstly advised them to learn from him and his team. Secondly, they were to quietly walk and eat their daily bread. Thirdly, they were to live righteously and not be downcast. Fourthly, if someone did not obey, that person was to be excluded from the community, but still be regarded as a brother. Day 324, Galatians 1-3 On the cross, Paul stressed to the Galatian church members who were shaken by false truths that we were made free not through the law, but by faith only. First point, Paul's focus on only Jesus' cross can be found in both Galatians and later Romans. During Paul's second missionary journey, Paul went to Corinth and spent a year and a half there. During this time, Paul wrote one and two Thessalonians and also Galatians. These three letters were his early letters and thus contained his sincere love towards the early churches. In particular, Galatians is the proclamation for peace and can be seen together with the Romans as letters for religious reformation. Paul wrote Galatians in order to persuade the church members that faith was above the matters of circumcision or the laws. Paul emphasized that there was nothing above the gospel and that it was confirmed through the Jerusalem Council that the most important thing was Jesus' cross. Paul also proclaimed to be free within Jesus Christ and to bear the fruits given from the Holy Spirit. Second point, Paul repeated the warnings he gave to the Antioch church regarding the laws and the circumcision to the Galatians church. Paul clearly revealed the reason he wrote Galatians. Similarly to the Antioch church, the Galatians church was also stuck in the issue of circumcision, the laws, faith, and salvation. Thus, to those who were so fixed on the old Jewish laws, Paul taught them that there is no other gospel than Jesus Christ. Paul wrote that he received his gospel from Jesus himself and that he was an apostle acknowledged by Jesus. Paul explained his apostleship by first declaring that it was given to him by Jesus. Second, he had been called by Jesus to become an apostle. Third, the gospel that he preached was not something he learned from other people. 
Fourth, he was honoring God through his missionary journeys. Third point, Paul taught the Galatians church of the recent decisions made from the Jerusalem Council that only faith could make a person righteous. In order to explain to the Galatians church about the updated decisions made in the Jerusalem Council, Paul firstly pointed out that he and Barnabas attended the council meeting. James, as the host, made the final declaration. It is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. The Jerusalem Council at that point had already declared that salvation was indeed possible without circumcision. But there were still some people in Galicia who believed that circumcision was crucial in order for salvation. Moreover, Paul added that he was just as much an apostle as Peter was. Paul proclaimed that his apostleship was not learned from other apostles, but was given directly from Jesus. In other words, Jesus had made Peter an apostle for the Jews first, and then made Paul into an apostle for foreigners. Paul explained of his apostleship through the gospel, and also added that he had once rebuked Peter. The point that Paul was getting to was that only faith could make a person righteous. Paul proclaimed that if law was the only thing that made one righteous, then Jesus died for nothing. Fourth point, Paul used the case of Abraham as an example to teach about receiving salvation through faith. After explaining all this, Paul started to rebuke the Galatians church by using a standard tactic. Paul told them that if they became obsessed with the law again, then they were making all their previous persecution worthless. Paul told them to decide whether the law was more important than faith. Paul used the case of Abraham to teach them about faith and salvation. Fifth point. Paul taught that the laws were a prerequisite to learning about Jesus. Paul taught the Galatians church that covenant came before the laws. Paul here was referring to God's grace covenant. God had given humans the grace covenant and the foundation of the law. The Galatians church, however, had the misconception that the physical circumcision and the keeping of the laws was the only path to salvation. Paul was distressed by this and emphasized that it was only through the faith in the cross of Jesus Christ that they could gain salvation. Paul taught them that what made Abraham so respectable was not because of his keeping of the laws, but because he was a man of faith. Through faith, he was able to become the father of all nations. The laws, in other words, were only applicable until Jesus came. Therefore, Paul taught them that the laws were a prerequisite within the path to learning about Jesus Christ. This was the ultimate proclamation that a person could only be saved through Jesus Christ and by believing that He is the Son of God. Day 325 Galatians 4-6 to They are the fruits of the Holy Spirit. Paul taught the Galatians church to bear fruits of the Holy Spirit with the true freedom obtained through faith while serving one another lovingly. First point. Paul used the parable of the guardian and the manager to teach about the role of the laws. Paul taught the Galatians church that the laws acted like the guardian and the manager up until God's decided moment. The reason God made them keep the laws was in order to contextualize Jesus Christ. Thus, God sent His only Son, Jesus Christ, to fulfill the laws and the prophets, and ultimately, in order to enable all humans to call God our Father. Paul, therefore, worried for those who voluntarily became servants of the laws. 
The gospel of Jesus was not there to distinguish the people, but to unify the people. However, if the laws were used to condemn others, then inevitably it would be used to separate rather than unify. Paul stressed that it was Jesus' will to unify the people. Second point, Paul taught about the difference of the laws and the gospel through Abraham's family story. Paul compared the laws and the gospel in order to teach the members of the Galatian church. In order to do so, Paul firstly reported to the laws in the story of Ishmael, who was born from Hagar. Secondly, he referred to the story of the laws involved with Isaac, who was born from Sarah. Thirdly, Paul taught that those people who only stressed the laws and persecuted those who preached the gospel would not be able to gain salvation. In the Old Testament, it is recorded that Abraham's son Isaac was given Abraham's covenant to continue as he was the one who kept his faith in God. As such, Paul used the example of Sarah and Hagar to explain how the Jews could gain their freedom through faith. In other words, the Jews had already received the freedom through being the descendants of Abraham. Paul earnestly convinced the members of the Galatians church to free themselves from being servants of the laws. Third point, in Galatians, Paul proclaimed the freedom of Christians. Paul taught the members of the Galatians church about how Christians were to live and act. Paul's main advice was to be free and not to become slaves of and for the law. Firstly, what Paul meant by freeing oneself from the law was to stop obsessing over the matter of circumcision. Secondly, Paul declared judgment against those who only preached the laws. Thirdly, he advised to live with those who enforced only the laws from their community. And now, Paul proclaimed the freedom of Christians. Paul said that Christians were to find freedom in Jesus Christ. Paul compared slavery and freedom and how Christians were to voluntarily serve others with the freedom they received from Jesus Christ. Fourth point, Paul taught that there are nine fruits in the Holy Spirit. Paul taught the members of the Galatian church to follow the Holy Spirit and eat from its fruit. Those who only followed the laws would end up living according to their physical needs. Paul warned that such people would not be able to enjoy the kingdom of God. Paul then referred to the nine fruits of the Holy Spirit that was in the gospel. Thus, Paul advised the members of the Galatians church to follow the Holy Spirit. Fifth point, Paul taught the church members not to be downcast when the fruit of a good deed did not appear right away. Paul taught the Galatians church to carry each other's burdens. He also taught them to carry out their tasks as best as they could and to be responsible. Paul furthermore taught them to help those who were traveling to preach Jesus' gospel. In other words, Paul told them not to be downcast when they could not see the results of their work immediately. Paul taught them to not be seduced by the laws. Paul knew the ways of the law keepers extremely well, that they did not practice by heart but only on the surface. Paul thus proclaimed that he only boasted of Jesus' cross. Paul emphasized that it was not by circumcision that humans became renewed but only through the faith in Jesus Christ. Because of this, Paul explained that he carried the mark of Jesus on him. Only through the gospel can humans gain eternal life. Paul told the members of the Galatian church that believing in this was God's grace. Day 326 
Acts chapter 18, verse 23 to chapter 19. Paul's third missionary journey. With the hope to preach the gospel in Rome, Paul stayed in Ephesus for two years and not the disciples for the kingdom of God. First point. During Paul's third missionary journey, Paul wrote 1 and 2 Corinthians in Ephesus and the Lord to Romans in Corinth. Paul's third missionary journey, which ended in Jerusalem, took a place between AD 53 and 57, so approximately four years. This third journey looked back at the places visited during the first and second journeys, and in particular, two years were spent in Ephesus. In Ephesus, Paul wrote 1 and 2 Corinthians, and then he headed to Corinth, where he wrote Romans. Second point, Priscilla and Aquila, who were Paul's fellow workers, helped the Apollos to work in the Corinthian church. During Paul's second missionary journey, he met a few people who came to believe in Jesus and also came to support Paul's missionary. Around the time Paul went to Ephesus, there was a man named Apollos, who came from Alexandria to teach the scriptures to the Jews. Apollos was a fine orator. He was well versed in the scriptures, but he had only been taught up to the point of John the Baptist and was yet to be updated on Jesus' cross, resurrection and ascension into heaven. Therefore, when Apollos met Priscilla and Aquila, they updated him about Jesus' final ministry. When Apollos was fully updated, Priscilla and Aquila sent Apollos to the Corinthian church that was lacking a preacher. At first, all was going well, but then a few problems occurred in the Corinthian church. And so Apollos went to seek Paul. Paul tried to send Apollos back to the Corinthian church, but Apollos really did not want to go back. Because of this, Paul wrote 1 and 2 Corinthians. Third point. Similar to the time, 120 people experienced the wonders of the Holy Spirit in Mark's attic. This occurred again to 12 people in Ephesus. During Paul's third missionary journey, there occurred an amazing spiritual experience in Ephesus. The reason Paul went to Ephesus was because he wished to return after visiting there during his second missionary journey. Paul came to find that in Ephesus, 12 people were having a spiritual experience, similar to when 120 people gathered in Mark's attic to experience the Holy Spirit. Fourth point, during Paul's second missionary journey, he established the Corinthian church for a year and a half, and then, during his third missionary journey, he established Ephesian church for three years. The highlight of Paul's third missionary journey was in Ephesus, where he was able to nurture disciples. Prior to this, Paul had gone to meet the Jews in Ephesus by preaching in the synagogue there for three months. A few men opposed Paul's missionary and forced him to stop, but this rather led to the making of disciples. Fifth point. In the Corinth trial, Governor Galileo gave a favorable ruling to Paul, and in Ephesus, the head clerk gave a favorable ruling to Paul. Just before Paul left Ephesus, a great riot was brought by a silversmith named Demetrius. The reason for this riot was because this silversmith was concerned that Paul was driving him out of business with his preaching, which meant that his atomist status was selling less. Demetrius wanted to seize Paul so that he would not be able to preach the gospel anymore. At this time, the head clerk of Ephesus calmed the disarray and made the riot stop. And the governor Galileo of Corinth had given Paul a favorable trial and helped him.
The clock in Ephesus also helped Paul to avoid this rage. After this incident, Paul left Ephesus and headed towards Macedonia. A three hundred and twenty-seven, one Corinthians one to four. Your bodies are the temples of Christ. Paul, who heard about the division within the Corinthian church, exhorted them to become united with one another in the wisdom of God and the power of the cross. First point, one and two Corinthians. Were Paul's letters written during his third missionary journey? During the time Paul spent in Ephesus, he wrote to the Corinthian church members in order to persuade them to have the attitude of service. This was coming from Paul, the minister. The context in which Paul wrote Corinthians was as follows: When Paul was in Ephesus. He heard the news of Corinth. This was that the members of the Corinthian church had divided themselves into followers of Paul, Apollos, Peter, and Jesus, and they were fighting among them. Thus, Paul wrote Corinthians in order to address the divisions within the church, and also regarding the attitude they were to have as Christians. At the time, the circumstances at the city Corinth and the Corinthian church were as follows: the city of Corinth was the capital of Greece, but at the time Greece was under the rule of the Roman Empire. During that time, the population of Corinth was approximately six hundred thousand, but this was divided into two hundred thousand civilians and. Four hundred thousand slaves. Corinth was a special place for maritime trade, and it was a port. Being located near the sea, this meant that Corinth was exposed to many new incoming religions. Amid such circumstances, the Corinthian church was set up by Paul during Paul's second missionary journey. Paul stayed in Corinth for a year and a half. In order to establish this church, Paul was assisted by Priscilla and Aquila. Once Paul left the Corinth to spread the gospel further, Apollos came to minister. Whilst residing in Corinth, Paul wrote one and two Thessalonians. Second point: Corinthians church divided themselves into those in favor of Paul, Apollos, Peter, and Christ. As Paul started the letter to the Corinthians, he firstly greeted the church members in Christ. After greeting them, Paul thanked them for their eloquent speech and thanked God for giving them wisdom. Paul also thanked them for expanding their faith and also for their abundant abilities. He also thanked God for their relationship with them. After his greeting and thanking them, Paul went into the main text of his letter, which concerned their internal division and conflict. The first part was about their division. The second was about their quarreling. The third was about baptism. Regarding these problems, Paul gave the following solutions. He firstly taught them about the power of the cross. He secondly taught them that the only thing they had to collectively boast about was Jesus. Paul advised them to realize the power and strength of Jesus' cross and boast only of this and nothing else. Here, Paul referenced the words of Jeremiah in the Old Testament. Third point: Paul confessed that when he preached the gospel in Corinth. He did not deliver human words or wisdom, but only the cross of Jesus Christ. Paul pointed out the problems in the Corinthian church, and then provided them with solutions. In Athens, Paul had made up his mind that he would not speak of his other knowledge, and only deliver the message of Jesus' cross. Thus, 
Paul had only delivered Jesus' cross to the Corinthian church. Paul then confessed the difficulties he experienced during his two missionary journeys, and especially whilst in Corinth, and how he was able to overcome them through the courage and guidance of the Holy Spirit. Paul was therefore able to teach the Corinthians about the wisdom of God. Here Paul referenced the words of Isaiah. To the Corinthians church, Paul taught that those who received salvation, received the Holy Spirit, and with the Holy Spirit, they would be able to distinguish the will of God. Here Paul again referenced Isaiah. First point, Paul taught that in the moment of Jesus' cross, our bodies became the temple of Christ. As Paul wrote the letter to the Corinthians, he was able to tell that their faith had not yet matured. Paul wrote that he and Apollos were missionaries who served God and who were voluntarily God's servants. Thus, Paul was the one who planted the Corinthian church. Apollos was the one who watered them. But it was only God who enabled them to grow. To them, Paul declared that their bodies were the temple of Christ. When Jesus proclaimed, It is finished on the cross, the curtains of the Jerusalem temple lifted, and at the moment, our bodies became the temple of Christ. After this, Paul wrote about the foolishness of the world. Here, Paul was referencing the words of Job's friend Eliphaz. Thus, Paul taught them not to judge the world through earthly wisdom, but through the knowledge of Jesus. Fifth point, in order to help the Corinthians church, Paul wrote letters and made Timothy deliver them. Paul taught the Corinthians church not to judge. He told them to regard the evangelists as those interested with God's secrets. What God requires from them is loyalty. Thus, human judgment is not important. The most important thing is God's final judgment. Paul continued to teach them not to be arrogant. They were to get rid of their arrogance and learn to be humble. Paul added that he was not able to immediately go to Corinth, but he sent it to them Timothy, who would come and help them. The first letter Paul sent to Corinthians most likely arrived in Corinth before Timothy. At the time, Timothy was on his way to Corinth from Macedonia. Paul did not want the Corinthian church to misunderstand, so he added that God's works were done not by word but by faith and power. Lastly, if they were to continue quarreling, Paul would punish them like a father. But if they repented, he would go to them with a loving heart. Day 328, 1 Corinthians 5 to 8. Divisions between the church members. Paul advised the Corinthian church to cut off habitual evil in their community and to establish a loving relationship with their neighbors. First point Paul taught the Corinthian church about the problem of immorality. Paul now spoke of a different problem that the Corinthian church had. This was none other than immorality. Immorality itself was a problem, but the fact that they did not regard this as a problem was the reason Paul rebuked them. Regarding the problems that may occur within the church, Jesus taught them in three stages. The first was to meet one to one. The second was to repent before two or three witnesses. The third was to advise the person to repent, and in the case that they did not, they were to be dismissed within the community. Paul rebuked them for not following these three steps to those who had fallen into immorality. He then told them to repent and be saved. Paul reminded them, of how they had misunderstood Paul's teachings in the past. In the past, when Paul taught them not to be pranked 
those who committed adultery, they had interpreted this the way they wanted. Thus, they want to leave the judgment about those people to God. However, as the church was established through the price of Jesus' blood, it was not an easy matter to cast out a member of the church. Paul therefore advised to stay away from those people. The body will decay after death, but the spirit lives on. So it is vitally important to make an environment whereby people will repent and be saved. It is thus important to help people repent and to start again. Second point, Paul taught about trial between the church members. Continuing on, Paul taught about the issue of trial between the church members. The first advice was to take on damages for giving. The second was that if the person who did wrong refused to apologize or repent, they would not be able to enter the kingdom of God. The church was to be the place where righteousness was carried out. It was furthermore the responsibility of the church to make sure that righteousness was carried out outside the church. However, problems occurred within the Corinthian church, which they were unable to sort out among themselves. When Paul heard this, he rebuked them and then taught them how to carry out a righteous and fair trial between them. Third point, Paul taught the Corinthian church that their bodies were God's possession. Paul rebuked the Corinthian church for being immoral in their hearts. He rebuked them for doing what Christians were not to do. As Paul had already taught the Corinthian church, their bodies were the temple of Christ, having been saved through Jesus' blood. Thus, it was their role to glorify Jesus. Paul then told them to never act immorally again. Being located near the port, Corinth was an area exposed to all sorts of immoral acts. In this place, some had taken in Jesus' gospel, but there were those who could not stop their old habits. Therefore, Paul taught them the meaning of their bodies and how they symbolized Jesus' blood. In other words, our bodies do not belong to us, but belong to God, and we must live to glorify Him. Fourth point, Paul told the Corinthian church that marriage should be considered with care and advised them accordingly. Paul's answer regarding marriage was that it was something one could choose to do or not do. One could serve God either through their marriage or by oneself. However, if one chose to get married, Paul thought that they had a responsibility towards each other. Regarding marriage, Paul said that it was fine to live by oneself. He also said that if one decided to get married, they were to be respectable and responsible in their positions. To those who were not married or widowed, Paul recommended living alone. As for those who married within the church, Paul banned divorce. Also, if one married a non-believer, they were not to divorce them, as they were to open up the chances of them accepting the gospel. In terms of the customs for living as a Christian, Paul explained that it did not matter much whether one was circumcised or not. What really mattered was that they were Christian. Also, whether one was a free man or a slave, the most important thing was that they were Christian. Fifth point, as a solution to eating food offered to idols, Paul provided the answer of love. Paul answered the questions the Corinthian church had concerning food offered to idols. Surprisingly, Paul had a simple answer, and this was love. When it came to the church, the solutions were in love rather than knowledge. Even if the food was for the idols, as God had made those foods in the first place, it was not contaminated. To clarify, Paul thought that idols were nothing. 
Second, he thought that it was normal to be free in the food choice. However, that choice was not to be forced on other brothers or sisters. Paul warned that people should not commit the sin of eating food served to idols. That would falter the faith of new believers for love of them. Day 329, 1 Corinthians 9 to 11. Paul proving his apostleship. Paul gave up his many rights for the gospel, claiming that knowing Jesus Christ was enough, and urged the Corinthian church to do the same. First point, Paul declared that the evidence of his apostleship was in the members of the Corinthian church. To the Corinthian church, Paul very clearly clarified that he was indeed an apostle. This was because the Corinthian church started to talk behind his back about his apostleship. To this, Paul said that the evidence of his apostleship lay in their church. In other words, although Paul was a free man, he had voluntarily given up his freedom in order to serve as an apostle. He had met Jesus in person and thus spread Jesus' gospel to the Corinthian church. Therefore, it should have been them who provided evidence of Paul's apostles. The reason some thought that Paul was not an apostle was because he was not among Jesus' disciples for three years. And because unlike the other apostles, he was self-funded in his ministry. Additionally, he did not have a family. Paul agreed that it was indeed right for the ministers to receive living expenses from the church. This was taken from the records in Deuteronomy. Paul also used the example of the workers in the temple recorded in the Old Testament, and this was taken from Numbers. Paul also referenced Jesus to prove that he was an apostle. Paul stated that although he had all the rights, he chose not to use them. Second point, Paul told the Corinthian church that he did not use his rights as he wished to spread the gospel. Paul made a declaration. Paul declared that although he had all the rights and freedom, he did not use them as he wished more than anything to spread the gospel far and wide. He clarified that he gave up his financial rights in order to fulfill his mission. He also stated that he gave up his freedom. Paul said that he had two identities. One was a post and the other was a free man. At the time, the Roman Empire protected their citizens through law. Paul was a Roman citizen from birth, and so his status was a free man. However, rather than choosing to be a free man in society, he chose to be a free man in the gospel and prioritized his law as an apostle before anything. Although he was not with Jesus like the other disciples for three years, he had met Jesus on his way to Damascus and was given the law to become an apostle by Jesus. He became a free man from his sins from the forgiveness of Jesus. Third point, in order to teach the Corinthian church about the problem of idol worship, Paul traced back the history of Israel's idol worship in order to ensure that they did not continue the mistakes of their ancestors. Paul mentioned the problem of idol offerings again in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. After mentioning it previously in chapter 8, Paul wished to get into this issue deeper. Therefore, Paul traced the history of Israel's idol worship in order to teach them. Paul compared this story to Jesus' story. Paul wrote about how during the days of Moses, God led the people from Egypt and then fed the people manna so that they did not die in the desert. However, the Exodus generation disobeyed God, except for Joshua and Caleb, and thus the last had to die in the desert. Paul therefore taught 
the Corinthian church not to disobey like the Exodus generation. Paul then taught them not to serve idols and to remember the instant of the golden calf. Paul then taught them not to commit immorality, not to test God, and not to resent God. As such, Paul told them to learn from the mistakes of the Israelites and to repent before God. Paul found the solutions to their problems by tracing the history of the Israelites. First point, Paul explained the relationship between Christ, man and woman, through the order of creation. Paul traced back to creation in order to teach the Corinthian church. This was not simply in reference to man and woman. Humans come in various forms, man, woman, elderly, young, etc. Everyone looks different and have different personalities. Each person is born through God's vision and plan. Paul thought that it was wrong to think that a man was above a woman, as God had not created man to live without a woman, or a woman to live without a man. Everyone was to live in Christ together. Fifth point, Paul emphasized the first Holy Communion of Jesus to the Corinthian church in order to educate them. Paul rebuked the church members for quarreling, when instead they were to work hard to become unified. At the time, the Corinthians ate together after worship and also held a Holy Communion. However, during meal times, the rich and poor were distinguished through the food that they were served. Also, those who came late to the meals did not have enough to eat. This led to the people living before Holy Communion and quarreling between them. Paul saw this as a big problem and so taught them about the meaning of Holy Communion. The reason the church commemorated Holy Communion was, For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, Paul retaught them about the right attitude they were to have, about the Holy Communion. Ultimately, Paul taught them to wait until everyone was present before starting to eat, and that he would personally attend to them soon to solve their other problems. Day 330, 1 Corinthians 12 to 14. What is a Christian? Although there are diverse gifts, eventually it is God who provides them, and their usage is for harmony and benefit of the church. First point, Paul taught the people to use their special talents given by God to contribute towards the church rather than to create a division. The Corinthian church had a question regarding God-given gifts, and so Paul replied that the core of these gifts was to confess that Jesus is Christ. Paul moreover explained that God gave humans gifts for their well-being. Although everyone's gifts differ, they all came from God and were used for God, and were all in the end the same. God gave humans gifts and also a community, so that we can all work together to do God's work. The Corinthian church had a misunderstanding about gifts. Thus, Paul explained that although each person was given different gifts, everyone's unique and individual gifts were united in God. With their gifts, they were all to fellowship and serve God with a unified heart. Second point, Paul taught that Christians were connected to Jesus Christ, who was the head of the church. Paul used the parable of the body and mind in order to explain why the Corinthian church members were to cooperate with each other. Paul hoped that they would serve each other in Christ. Paul therefore used the parable of the body and mind in order to explain the relationship between Christ and the church. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. Third point, Paul taught that the core of love was to practice it in daily life. 
statement Paul heard that the members of the Corinthians church quarreled with the issue of the gifts given by God, he tried to correct their way of thinking by helping them understand that the best gift was love. Paul told them to eagerly desire the great gifts. The great gift mentioned here was indeed love. At the time, the Corinthian church members, as well as Christians and the whole, believed that the following abilities were precious. First, the ability of dialect and prophecy. Second, the ability to make a miracle. Third, the ability of age. And fourth, the ability to be a martyr. However, all these abilities were missing its core if they were not carried out with love for God and for neighbors. Paul explained the characteristics of love. True love was to be implemented in daily life. Later on, St. John also defined what love meant. Fourth point, Paul taught further about the special talent given by God and how to use it for the church community. Paul continued to teach the Corinthians church about gifts. He first taught them to long for prophecies. Second, to those who did not understand dialect, Paul explained through parables. If a pipe or harp is prayed, but there is no distinction in the notice, then no one will know what the tune is. On the same lines, if the sound of a trumpet cannot be heard properly before battle, then no one can prepare for war at the right time. Third, Paul taught that those who were given the gift of dialect were to pray for the gift of translation. Fourth, Paul gave a testimony about gifts. Paul moreover taught them about God's gift of dialect and prophecy and their purposes. He then told the church members to be full of wisdom and also taught them the purpose of dialect and prophecy as written in Isaiah. Paul compared them to how their ancestors did not listen to the words of the prophets, and so had to live under the rule of other nations. Thus, Paul advised the church to seek prophecy more so than dialect. Fifth point, Paul reminded the church members that God-given talents exist in order to establish and sustain the church. Paul told the Corinthian church to take care in establishing the order of the church. This involved using all the gifts for the church community. Concerning dialect and prophecy, Paul gave the following teachings. During dialect, there was to be a translator. When there was no translator, dialect was forbidden. Prophecy was likewise to be done one person at a time and to take turns when another person spoke. There was to be order established regarding these matters. Day 331 1 Corinthians 15-16 Witnesses of Resurrection Paul stressed that believers should have hope in the resurrection and encouraged the Corinthian church to be glad in relieving the Jerusalem church. First point, Paul taught the Corinthian church to have hope in resurrection. One Corinthians records many of the answers Paul gave to the Corinthian church members who asked the questions. In chapter 15, Paul did not write that they specifically asked regarding the question of resurrection but he added this with the consideration that they should know. Paul moreover testified that many people witnessed Jesus' resurrection. Among them were Peter, the other disciples, 500 brothers, James and all the other apostles, then Paul himself. Paul testified that Jesus came to him who at the time was persecuting Christians and revealed his resurrected form so that Paul could testify. Second point, Paul taught that the resurrected Jesus would ensure that the church members also resurrected. Paul confirmed to the Corinthian church who doubted Jesus' resurrection 
that Jesus did indeed raise up from the dead and that they would also resurrect. Paul said that if there was no resurrection, it would be useless to believe in the gospel or to have faith and furthermore, they would all be useless witnesses. If there was no resurrection, those who died and those who were to die would be forever destroyed. If there was no resurrection, those who had the faith would have to live without any hope. Paul confirmed that the resurrected Jesus would enable the church members to also resurrect. This was all possible through Jesus. Thus, Paul told them that all would resurrect when Jesus came for the second time. Ultimately, when he came for the world to end, Jesus would bring the final victory. Third point, Paul declared that the church members would experience resurrection and witness the final glory. Paul told the Corinthians church about how they would experience resurrection. Paul thanked God for promising us the second coming of Jesus Christ and for the final victory through the laws which were prerequisite into the gospel. Humans were to realize their sins and the part of sin was death. However, although it was only natural for humans to die, all humans who believed in Jesus Christ would be able to resurrect again and experience the final victory. Paul referenced Isaiah and Hosea as proof of this and gave thanks to God. As such, Paul taught them about the resurrection and then advised them not to waver or misunderstand. Fourth point, Paul asked the Corinthians church to treat Timothy, who was going to them in Paul's place, as they would treat Paul himself. As Paul wrote to the Corinthians church, he asked them to provide financial aid to the Jerusalem church. Paul had previously asked the same request to the Galatians church. It is likely that Paul asked all the places he went to help the Jerusalem church. The reason he wished to collect the funds was in order to help the Jerusalem church who were poor. Paul hoped that the Jerusalem church would collaborate with the other churches and practice love and giving. As Paul wrote 1 Corinthians, he asked them to take care of Timothy, who was on his way from Macedonia. Paul had worried that Timothy would face difficult when he arrived at the Corinthians church at the time was facing internal divisions. Timothy was on his way to Corinth. Paul knew that his letter would reach Corinth first, and so he asked in his letter to take care of Timothy before he arrived. Fifth point, Paul outlined the news of the other churches in Asia and ended his letter by telling the churches to greet one another. As Paul finished his first letter to the Corinthians, he requested a few things to them. The first was to be on your guard, stand firm in the faith, be courageous, be strong. And secondly, do everything in love. After this, Paul wrote his final wishes. Paul wanted the church members to read his letter together and then greet one another through a holy kiss. This was to get over their quarreling and misunderstanding. Paul lastly wrote his wishes for the church to greet Priscilla and Aquila. Day 332 2 Corinthians 1-4 You are the letters of Christ. The fragrance of Christ conveyed through Christians is the channel which gives life to the people of the world and helps them to be saved. First point, Paul asked the Corinthians church to continually pray and persecution was to continue. Paul wrote his letter so that it could be circulated around the Corinthians church and then to the other churches across the region. 
He hoped that it would reach Athens and other churches around. As Paul wrote to Corinthians, he firstly greeted them, praised God, and then explained why he was unable to greet them in person, and instead was writing a letter. He wrote that he was going through difficulty. We do not know exactly what he was referring to, but we can imagine that it was persecution against the Christians. Paul wrote that it was harsh to a point of losing hope in life. Paul asked the Corinthian church to pray for him as he faced more persecution in the future. This was as Paul had the faith that God would listen to their prayers. Second point, Paul explained why he had to postpone his visit to the Corinthian church. Paul wrote in his previous letter his plans to visit the church. Although Paul had plans to revisit, he was unable to go, and so some of the church members started to misunderstand. Thus, Paul wrote another letter to explain the reasons. Paul explained why he had to postpone his trip several times. The first was to obey God's command. The second was to give the church some time to figure out their problems among them. After this time was up, Paul hoped to spend more time with them. Paul put God's plans before his own. From afar, Paul prayed and hoped for the Corinthians to march in their faith. However, Paul came to find out that some of the church members had misunderstood his first letter. Paul therefore expressed that he had only love for them. Paul did not wish to rebuke them, but rather wanted to console and encourage them so that they would continue to establish the church. A third point, Paul outlined what he thought was apostleship to the Corinthian church. Paul thanked God for giving him his apostleship. He thanked God for giving strength to apostles to be victorious through Jesus Christ. He also thanked God that he was able to spread the scent of Christ as an apostle. The scent of Christians could help people to start a new life by helping them to get to know Jesus better. Paul confessed that his role was to pass on this scent. Although there are many who tried to make a living off God's words, he wished to be used as God's tool to spread the scent of Christ, and he told this to the Corinthian church. Furthermore, he told the church members that the evidence of his apostleship was in the Corinthian church members. Among the Corinthian church, there are few who questioned Paul's apostleship, and so Paul very clearly pointed out that he was part of the new covenant given by God. Fourth point, Paul taught that those who were workers for the new covenant would seek glory beyond belief. Paul wrote about the glory for the worker of the new covenant. This was the covenant given by Jesus. This was previously predicted by Jeremiah. Paul revealed that he was not a worker for the laws that tried to kill him, but a worker for God's new covenant, which saved him. Thus, the new covenant was full of glory. Paul explained that the laws eventually killed humans for their sins. Paul therefore explained the laws as an elementary level into the learning of Jesus' gospel. Paul then compared the laws to the gospel, the old covenant and the new covenant, the trials and the spirit, killing and saving, glory and bigger glory, finite and infinite things, etc. What Paul ultimately wanted to teach was that the old covenant was incomparable to the new covenant in terms of glory. Fifth point, Paul stressed that it was possible to spread the gospel no matter how severe the persecution or hardship became. Paul stressed that his apostleship focused only on spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
The reason Paul decided this was firstly because God gave Paul the light of the knowledge of God's glory. Secondly, God had given to Paul a treasure in jars of clay. Therefore, Paul declared that he was able to spread the gospel no matter what hardship or persecution. Paul confessed that when someone came across the gospel, their physical appearance may wither, but their internal state is renewed. He also added that the persecution was temporary, but God's glory was forever. Day 333, 2 Corinthians 5-9 Widen your hearts. A Christian's duty was to make peace through the help of the Holy Spirit and to serve beyond one's circumstances. First point, Paul declared that the reason he was able to spread only Jesus' gospel was because he truly believed in eternal life and the final judgment. Paul revealed the reason as to how he was able to only spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul taught the Corinthian church members that although our physical bodies are on earth, our eternal lives were in heaven. For this reason, God had sent the Holy Spirit. Christians could therefore be courageous and have a desire to be with God. Paul moreover explained that he was able to spread only the gospel of Jesus Christ as he absolutely believed in God's final judgment. He added that he was able to endure all the current hardship and persecution, as he dreamed of God's joy and the spreading of the gospel. Paul declared that he wished more to be with God than for his body to live easily on earth. In other words, he proclaimed that although he was going through much difficulty, he was ultimately full of joy, and he knew that his reward was heaven. Second point, Paul, who was a peacemaker, taught the Corinthian church members to have a big heart. Paul declared to the Corinthian church that he received his apostleship from Jesus' everlasting love. Paul said this, not to reveal his status, but to clarify to those who did not understand. Since meeting Jesus on his way to Damascus, Paul's life had completely changed. Thus, Paul was able to proclaim that those who met Christ were renewed. Paul added that God had helped them fellowship. On these lines, Paul told the Corinthian church to also fellowship with God. Paul warned them not to put to waste God's blessing or grace. Here, Paul referenced the words of Isaiah. Following on, Paul revealed the hardships he endured as an apostle, but how none of this got in his way of spreading Jesus' gospel. Paul here was confirming his apostleship, as some of the members of the Corinthian church had doubts of his apostleship. Paul was trying to become a peacemaker in all of this. Paul first advised them to have a big heart. Paul clearly explained the reason as to why problems between them occurred in the first place. This was ultimately as they had closed their hearts. They had no idea how much Paul had suffered for the gospel. Paul advised them to accept him as their spiritual father and to listen to his advice. Second, Paul advised not to go along with those who did not believe in God. Paul justified the members of the Corinthian church to be God's people. Third, Paul advised them to live as God's holy people. In other words, Paul gave them the identity as God's children and told them to live as a holy people of God. Third point, Timothy's news about the Corinthian church managed to provide Paul with immense consolation and joy. Paul's team endured a great deal of hardship in Macedonia. 
However, some good news reached the Paul amidst this hardship from Timothy that the Corinthian church members had repented. Paul was most pleased to hear that the Corinthian church members were working hard to protect Paul against those who tried to persecute him and also that Titus had safely returned. The first letter that Paul sent to the Corinthian church was 1 Corinthians. However, after reading this letter, the members of the Corinthian church misunderstood. And so Paul followed up with 2 Corinthians, chapters 10 to 13. After reading Paul's second letter, the church members cleared up their misunderstanding. This was great news for Paul, as he had actually worried after sending his second letter, which rebuked them. Luckily, however, the church members read his letter and repented of their sins. Paul was relieved first, as the Corinthian church members had accepted his apostleship. Second, Paul was pleased that they had welcomed Titus and that there had been a change in the church. Third, Paul was pleased that his praises about the Corinthian church became validated through Titus. Fourth, Paul was pleased to hear that the Corinthian church members received Titus obediently. Fourth point, Paul taught the Corinthian church that providing financial aid to the Jerusalem church was incredibly important. In his third letter, Paul once again emphasized the matter of providing financial aid to the Jerusalem church. Initially, the Corinthian church members had got the wrong idea that Paul was using the funds for himself. Despite this, Paul once again mentioned this matter and emphasized that it was crucial to provide Jerusalem church with financial aid. Paul taught that providing aid to the poor was an incredibly important matter. Paul added that the Macedonia church had also provided financial aid to the Jerusalem church. Paul had in some ways made the Corinthian church and the Macedonian church compete in order to help the Jerusalem church. Macedonian church here reported to Philippi, Thessalonica, and Berea. Although they were not wealthy themselves, they still provided financial aid. Macedonian church paid more than they could afford. As they were willing to pay so much, Paul was worried for their livelihood. Despite their own financial hardship, they still paid more than Paul expected. They gave themselves to God and also endeavored to live according to God's will. As such, Paul used the Macedonian church as an example to the Corinthian church. Fifth point, in order to financially help the Jerusalem church, Paul sent three people to the Corinthian church. Paul sent three workers to the Corinthian church to collect aid for the Jerusalem church. One person who volunteered was Titus. The second person was one who was praised by the church and someone who had already gone to collect funds from the Macedonian church. The third member was someone who dearly loved the Corinthian church. The reason Paul sent these three members was firstly because the Corinthian church members still had not completed what they had been preparing for a year. Secondly, if this news had begun to spread, this would be an embarrassment to other churches. Thirdly, Paul wanted to make sure that the funds were recollected before Paul went to visit the Corinthian church again. Paul stressed that the people who prepared the funds for the Jerusalem church would be blessed by God. Day 334 2 Corinthians 10 to 13 Paul's spiritual experience Paul boasted that God worked through his weakness and encouraged the Corinthians church members to establish God's church 
as the body of Christ. First point, the misunderstanding of the Corinthian church regarding Paul's apostleship began due to Paul's humble attitude. From 2 Corinthians chapter 10, Paul began to declare and testify his apostleship in full force. The Galatians church had a debate about Paul's apostleship in terms of traditions. And the Corinthians church had a problem with the way in which Paul carried out his ministry. Against these opinions, Paul replied and defended his apostleship. To the Corinthians church members who criticized Paul for not being more charismatic, Paul replied that he was trying to serve them with humility and that he planned on continuing to do so. Paul added that he hoped they would stop judging him or others merely on appearance. Paul declared that he wanted to use the apostleship given by God to show humility and meekness to the church. Paul then revealed the foolishness of those who misunderstood his apostleship and of the things they boasted about. Paul taught them that the only thing to boast about was Jesus Christ. Here, Paul reported to Jeremiah. Paul wrote that his apostleship did not depend on their praise, but on God's praise. Second point, Paul confessed his hardships until now as an apostle in order to prove that he was an apostle. Paul proved his apostleship to the Corinthian church and then compared his ministry to those of the false apostles. Paul moreover rebuked the Corinthian church for so easily accepting other gospels. Most unfortunately, some of the members of the Corinthian church misunderstood Paul's self-funded ministry. To this, Paul explained that in order to serve them, he voluntarily humbled himself before them and made his own living himself. Paul very clearly explained that he was trying to level himself with them so that they would understand. Paul furthermore detailed the hardship he had to endure as an apostle. Paul first explained how he was a Jew by blood and tradition. Second, Paul outlined the dangers and hardships he endured. Third, he explained the worries and concerns he had for the church. Fourth, Paul confessed his weaknesses and stressed that God helped him to overcome them. As such, Paul came across many people who accused him that he was not a real apostle, a liar, and so on. To this, Paul defended his apostleship and boasted how God had even used his weakness. Third point, Paul explained his spiritual experience in order to prove his apostleship. In order to further prove his apostleship to the Corinthian church, Paul told them of his spiritual experiences as well as how he had seen heaven. However, he did not include specific details. This was because he believed that this would not produce positive outcomes. He furthermore believed that such postings were unnecessary. What Paul truly wished to reveal was his weakness and how in such moments God revealed his strength. Paul stressed that the reason God enabled Paul to have spiritual experiences was not so that Paul could boast, but so that God could reveal his glory. Paul also added that God gave him physical defects so that he did not become arrogant. To conclude his defense, against those who questioned his apostleship, Paul said the following. The first was that he thought it was foolish that he had to boast of his apostles. The second was despite how he thought it was foolish, he nevertheless had to do so in order for them to understand that he was indeed an apostle. The third was that he did not receive their help 
like other apostles. But if they found this unfair, then he hoped that they would forgive him. First point, Paul told his plans to visit Corinth for the third time. Paul wrote that he wished to visit Corinth for the third time, with the heart of a parent visiting his children. Paul also rebuked them for their misunderstanding about him. Paul wrote that he was going to find those who tried to frame him for smuggling financial aids and come clear about what he and his members were trying to do with the funds. Paul added that he hoped his explanation would help the church to move forward. Paul furthermore wrote with hopes that they would be changed by the time he came to visit them and that he feared that they would not repent. Fifth point, Paul warned the Corinthians church that if they did not change their attitude and thinking before he visited them, for the third time, they would not be able to avoid their punishment. Paul declared that if the Corinthians church did not repent, by the time he came to visit them, they would not be able to avoid punishment. Paul advised them not to become a target of punishment. Paul stated his plans to visit them and then gave them their final warning. This was that they would not be forgiven if they continued on with their adulterous behavior. He truly wished that they would turn from their old ways and strengthen their faith. Paul then concluded his second letter.